Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all so much for coming out bright and early on a Thursday morning. My name is Janelle George. I'm Senior Policy Advisor with the Learning Policy Institute. And as many of you know, LPI conducts independent, high-quality research to improve education policy and practice. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us for what will actually be the first in a series of events that will examine equity, quality, and access in public schools. Subsequent events will include examinations of choice and innovation, choice and school integration or resegregation, and choice and access. And you will all receive information and updates about these subsequent events. So at this point, uh, it's my pleasure, um, first of all, to announce that uh, LPI is partnering with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund on these series of events. And to welcome our colleague, counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Nicole Dooley. Good morning, um, and I'd like to add my thanks for joining us today for equity, equality, and access. How do we create schools we're choosing for all? My name is Nicole Dooley, and I'm policy counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. LDF was founded in 1940 under the leadership of the late Thurgood Marshall, Justice Thurgood Marshall. We have enjoyed a close relationship with the Learning Policy Institute over the years. In fact, our president and director of counsel, Sherilyn Eiffel, is on the board for LPI. We are delighted to advance our mission of achieving racial justice, equality, and an inclusive society by co-hosting today's event with LPI, which examines ways to promote access to quality educational opportunities for all students. It is now my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, um, the president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute. You can read her full bio in your materials, but some highlights include that she is the Charles E. Ducommon Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University, where she founded the Stanford Center for Opportunity uh, Policy and Education. She is the past president of the American Educational Research Association and recipient of its award for distinguished contributions to research, lifetime achievement, and research to policy. She began her career as a public school teacher and co-founded both a preschool and a public high school. Throughout her career, she has been a tireless champion for civil rights and equal educational opportunities for all students. Please join me in welp welcoming Dr. Darling Hammond. Wow, we have a full house. It is great to see you all here this morning. Uh, those of you who are here in Washington, D.C. do not need me to tell you that choice has become a hot policy topic. Uh, in this town and uh, across the country, uh, it is the primary agenda uh, for the current uh, administration. Uh, the current conversation about choice is typically about um, vouchers or charter schools. But as we will hear this morning, neither of those actually represents more than a tiny slice of school choice in the United States. From the tradition of neighborhood public schools, there has been considerable evolution over the years. Uh, we have uh, seen choice for integration through magnet schools in the 1960s. Uh, we've also seen choice for segregation through white segregation academies. Um, funded in a number of counties. We've seen choice for innovation beginning in New York City as early as the early 1900s with the Little Red Schoolhouse and over waves and waves of decades, uh, various schools of choice um, that uh, in the 1970s and 80s um, warranted an entire alternative schools division, uh, things like the international High School, Central Park East Elementary and Secondary School, the work that Tony Alvarado did in District 4 and then District 2, uh, and then ultimately uh, the entire system of New York City in the 1990s and thereafter, 
became a system of public school choice. Uh, all one million students choosing elementary schools within community school districts and junior high and high schools across the entire five boroughs. Um, and those schools, uh, many of them very innovative, launched by Chancellor Joe Fernandez when he called for proposals from teachers and administrators and community groups in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, have often spawned networks of schools that are now spreading across the whole country. Um, many of them uh, run by other districts as well. More recently, we've had the introduction of public school charters, which were initially launched in many places for the purpose of innovation uh, and uh, launched many new models. In fact, the first charter school in Massachusetts was Ted Sizer's uh, Parker School uh, in Minnesota. There were a set of schools that were teacher run that were launched uh, in the early 1990s. Um, some schools that had been in private uh, settings like Montessori schools began to come into the public school system uh, through charters, but now also exist as district-run schools. So we see very distinctive educational philosophies like Montessori and Waldorf schools uh, that exist as both uh, district-run public schools and as charter schools as well as at private schools. So we've got all kinds of choices that spread across a variety of sectors. And in fact, um, when uh, one of our speakers, Jonathan Raymond, was superintendent in Sacramento, he uh, brought a number of those kinds of models into the uh, public school system. Uh, for some people, choice is about, is about innovation and opportunities for students to find the kind of distinctive philosophy or type of school that they need. Um, and in California, for example, we have linked learning schools, which are career technical academies that are spreading across the state uh, within public school districts. And people, the students choose, you know, a medical sciences academy or a construction trades academy or whatever the particular orientation might be. For others, choice is really a means for competition. Uh, and some see charters in that way as a way to cause other schools to feel more motivated uh, to do what they have been holding back on doing uh, otherwise um, and are stimulated by competition. The laws and regulations governing all of these approaches vary from state to state. And one of the uh, report that we're going to talk about today really uh, talks about that. We did a previous report called High Quality Options, uh, a guide for state policymakers. And we've begun to really look at what are the ways in which choice is framed, managed, regulated, which has a great deal to do with what the outcomes of the choice plans are. These laws and regulations uh, vary from state to state, from district to district, and even within the same state or district over time. And the outcomes can vary greatly. So for example, at one point, uh, Minnesota had an open transfer in her district law that allowed uh, students to go from district to district with a purpose of integration and it was in fact because of the rules integrative those rules were changed uh, and some of the choices then became more segregative uh, as a result of that change in New York City where I worked for many years uh, with a variety of spectacular educators who really designed uh, new model schools throughout the district how many folks here are here from New York City all right it's a hotbed of uh, innovative uh, education. There was a period of time where the rules governing the choice system uh, were very specific about being sure that choices as families would choose a, a number of schools in a list, that the choices that they were allocated uh, enhanced racial diversity, socioeconomic diversity, uh, and diversity by tested achievement in different schools. Those rules were changed. Uh, and now New York City still has a system of choice, but it is much less focused on integrating students as its purposes. Uh, we've seen how uh, charter laws in places like Ohio and Arizona, uh, which according to studies by the Credo Center at uh, Stanford, get very poor outcomes, um, have many authorizers and little accountability, whereas uh, the charter law in Massachusetts, which has some of the strongest outcomes for its 81 charter schools, uh, require extensive accountability for curriculum, for staff quality, for the nature of the program, and for access 
to the point where every school has to show how they recruit and retain English learners and special education students. And there are even mystery parent calls that the Department of Education makes uh, to find out if uh, I want to enroll my child in your school, uh, what will you be able to do for him, uh, who, my child who has Down syndrome or my child who is autistic. If the school says, we really think you should choose another school, that school will lose its charter. So we're launching this series of um, conversations and reports uh, with the initial set of reports, and you have on your flash drive the Tapestry of American Public Education, which you will uh, hear more about in just a moment, um, in order to explore these questions uh, about how can we, in fact, uh, not have choice for its own sake, uh, but have choice organized and managed in such a way that it offers high quality options for all students, including high quality neighborhood public schools, which is the major choice that parents want to make when they have that option of choice, that offers access to all students and that supports and um, uh, enables a greater integration in our increasingly divided society. I just wanna make the point that uh, choice doesn't always mean choice. I did a study with colleagues uh, at Stanford a few years ago in uh, New Orleans, which has become a system of in, um, entirely now of charters. It was mostly charters at that time. And we interviewed a lot of kids and a lot of parents about their choices. And uh, we found uh, parents of special ed students, uh, one who had applied to 30 schools in the hope that her child would get accepted into one school. The Southern Poverty Law Center had had to sue because most of the schools were not accepting special education students. We talked to another young man who said, well, I didn't really have any choices. Uh, the schools I wanted to go to were full. Uh, they assigned me to the school. I asked about it, and uh, I said, wasn't somebody shot there last week? And the person who was assigning me said, yeah, that's your school. Uh, not a choice. Uh, lots of um, the... Uh, uh, lowest income families, families with kids with who are the most vulnerable. Um, choice did not mean choice uh, for them. Uh, some wonderful schools are created in that context, but some horrible circumstances for many uh, of the lowest income families. Long bus rides past other schools that they couldn't get into, two hours away to get to the school that, uh, to which they were assigned. Uh, and uh, lots of stories about kids getting pushed out of schools when they were not able to perform. So choice has to, if we're going to engage with choice in American public education, it has to be uh, an actual choice. Uh, our um, a series on choice uh, and how we can enable it to be a meaningful, productive part of American democratic public education We'll look at choice and innovation, choice and integration, choice and access, and we'll continue to ask the question, can we have choice, how can we have choice, in high quality schools, including neighborhood schools, that meet students' needs uh, in all communities? Uh, so with that, I'm gonna introduce my colleague, our executive director and co-author of the report uh, on the Tapestry of American Public Education, uh, Patrick Shields. Patrick has over 25 years of experience uh, managing large-scale social science research projects. He's co-authored a number of our publications. He will provide an overview of the study, and then we will get into a conversation about it. Patrick. Good morning. So um, first of all, I want to just uh, acknowledge that uh, this, my co-authors, uh, Linda and Peter Cookson and Bob Rothman, there were four of us as well as the broader LPI team that, that worked on this report. So um, LPI, you know, is three years old. Uh, we started in September of 2015, and uh, we specifically uh, chose not to focus our research at the beginning of the organization on choice. Um, but two years ago, 2016, obviously the debate over choice started to heat up here in Washington. And back in California, there was um, a debate going on in Los Angeles, our, our largest district, 
and the district in the country with the largest number of students in charters, um, about increasing the number of charters. About 29, 30% of the schools in LA are charter schools. And the question on the table is, should we move from 30% to 50%? That was the question being debated at the school board meetings. And so in that context, we sort of asked the question, how might LPI productively engage in this debate over choice? And as we talked to the people in LA, the community groups, the school board, the business community that we were uh, in, the, in the union that we were involved in, we realized that we weren't asking the right question. The question shouldn't be, should it be 30% or 40% or 42% or 50% of the schools in the district should be choice. But the question should be, how can choice play a role in the creation of a system of schools, not a set of independent schools, but a system of schools that would ensure that all schools were worth choosing and that all students were chosen by a, a high quality school? And so that was sort of the framing that we took into this whole thing. And we started a series of research reports. We've been active in some policy debates. And as Linda pointed out, we now are uh, teaming up with our partners to um, have a series of these forums on the, on the issue. So I'm going to sort of put some data behind some of the points that Linda made. Um, and But don't worry about the numbers that I throw out here. They're all in the paper, which is on your flash drive and now available at this moment on the web, as will these PowerPoints be in, in a minute. OK. So we came up with this term, the rich tapestry of choices, uh, thanks to Charmaine Mercer from the Hewlett Foundation, who sort of was one of the uh, persons who sort of gave us this idea at the, at the very beginning. And one of our first findings, of course, is that choice is very widespread. There's 18.7 million families in the US, according to the National Center of Education Statistics, that report that they have a choice in what public school their ch children attend. And there's about 6.5 million uh, families who actually have exercised that choice. Importantly, um, most of those choice schools are actually managed by the traditional school districts and our traditional public schools in one way or another. So for example, there's as many magnets essentially, 2.6, there's 2.6 million students in magnet schools in, in the country versus 2.7 million in charters. So we talk a lot about charters, but magnets are actually a very important part of the story as well. And we'll be getting into this in a little bit more detail in a, in a minute. Um, the other uh, big finding here is that most parents, 77% <laughs> report that they're actually s satisfied with their current school, that it is, in fact, their first choice. And that includes over three quarters of the parents who are in their neighborhood school. That is, the vast majority of parents whose children are going to their neighborhood assigned school consider that their first choice. So most parents are getting their first choice. Important point. OK. <clears throat> After. Um, so given, given what we know about um, the data, we started to ask ourselves the question that, well, so if the question isn't should we have choice or not, or what portion of school should be choice or not, what is the question? And so then the question that we came up with was, you know, what, under what conditions can choice play a productive role in systems of schools that provide for high quality schools, more equitable access, and for greater social, racial, and economic integration. So these are the three themes that you're going to see throughout the discussion and the report when you get a chance to, to see it. These are sort of the criteria that we're applying when we're looking at questions about choice. Again, not good, bad. It's here. It's here to stay. It's widespread. The question is, how can it play a role that's productive to getting us better schools, integrated and diverse schools, and schools that are accessible for all families, not just a, a subset of families. OK, so I'm going to talk about four or five different types of choice that are widespread and just give a little bit of data on them. But again, you can find all of the data in your, um, in your, in your, uh, on your flash drive and on the web when you, when you leave here. Don't look at it now. Um, OK, so the, the most popular and sort of the oldest form of choice is just sort of open enrollment. There's two kinds of open enrollment intra-district. Within the district, you're able to not just go to your neighborhood school, but choose to go to other schools. And there's 22 states that allow for that. Um, and inter-district um, uh, choice in which you're able to actually leave your district and go to a neighboring district. And there's 25 states 
uh, across the country. So there's literally millions of kids who are involved in this, this kind of choice. There's different examples. So um, oh, I'm, I'm pressing the wrong thing here. Um, so an interdistrict choice, Linda mentioned the long history of choice in, in New York City, the current small schools movement. There's really great data on that. Another example in Massachusetts is, is Cambridge. And Cambridge provides an example of what we call controlled choice, which is not just anybody goes wherever they want, but that the district ensures that people moving from school to school result in greater integration instead of segregation. So right now in Cambridge, for example, 84% of the students are in what you'd call integrated schools, okay, um, versus some other districts, as you know, where it's getting worse. Then interdistrict transfer programs, um, Linda mentioned the one in uh, Minnesota, which is a, a great example. Um, it's a big program, 38,000 students are involved in this, and of course it's highly centralized in Minneapolis, St. Paul area, where students are able to from the suburban districts come into the uh, city schools or from the city schools go out to the suburban districts. And when the um, law was first put in place, as Linda mentioned, there was um, a, a explicit policy that it couldn't lead to greater segregation. And so it actually had an integrative effect. That is, there was movement, but the movement resulted in more diverse rather than less diverse schools. In 2000, there was a a ruling by the Attorney General in Minnesota that open enrollment schools could be um, exempt from any policies associated with segregation. And the result was a resegregation of the city school. So in 2000, right before this policy was reversed, there were only 10 schools in Minneapolis St. Paul that were highly segregated. Highly segregated in Minneapolis St. Paul means more than 90% of the kids are African American. Um, a few years later, that number was 83. So as soon as the segregation limitation was taken off, there was a great deal of white flight out of the city to suburban schools, which resulted in greater, um, greater segregation. OK. Another um, uh, type of choice that Linda mentioned are, are magnet schools. So magnet schools have been with us for a long time. Um, and they are um, obviously, um, these are theme schools. You've all heard of the STEM Academy, Art Academy, the Link Learning are magnets of a, of a sort that Linda mentioned. There's 3,400 magnet schools um, nationwide in over 600 school districts, and I mentioned earlier 2.6 million uh, students in, involved in them. The data actually are, are, is pretty impressive. There are some uh, series of national studies. There are some highly controlled uh, RCTs on magnets. There are some good local studies on magnets that consistently show positive effects on achievement, attitudes, teachers' attitudes, et cetera. Although when you get underneath it, there's a lot of unevenness in the data. Even That is, even within some districts, there's magnets that are very successful and other magnets that are less successful. And we delve into that in some greater um, detail in the report. And then the last um, uh, um, type of choice that I want to talk about, um, Linda used the term model. And it's a, this is now here is a broad array. This ranges from you know, success for all, which I'm sure you've all heard of, to, um, to uh, other newer programs like New Tech High and High Tech High and some of these. And these are sort of, they're, they're very important because they not only are have, have developed good schools, individual schools, but they have worked very hard on replicating and figuring out how to replicate them under different circumstances across the country. So New Tech High, for example, has you know, 200 plus schools around the country. And in fact, we've done a study on, uh, on these networks, which will be released in January. Right? Um, and uh, so the point here is that there's there ha a wide variety of different kinds. We go into detail in the report that you can see. Um, but it's sort of, uh, oh, and then, ah, almost forgot charters. Um, <coughs> and then charters, you know, what to say about charters? Of course, first of all, it's the fastest growing sector, right? I mean, it's, you know, a few years ago, 1% of the kids in the country, now it's 5% of the kids in the country are in charters, et cetera. Um, as Linda mentioned, there is just really wide variation across states in how um, charters are held accountable, how they are authorized, whether or not they are authorized through districts, institutions of higher education, um, or you know, in Indianapolis, the mayor authorizes schools, right? So it, it, it 
It's very different. There's many uh, ma different management structures, meaning about 60% of the schools, about six out of every 10 charters is independently run. But increasingly, they're run through charter management organizations that you, of course, know about, places like KIPP and Vision Schools and, um, uh, and, and, and that type of network. That's about 29% of the charters in the country are run that way. And then about 15% are actually run by for-profit uh, management organizations. Um, so they vary in how they're held accountable, how they're authorized, how they're managed, how they're even within states, within districts, how they're overseen. And the result of this, as Linda pointed out, is the outcomes are highly, um, highly variable. Um, so the big credo study that um, Linda uh, mentioned, Credo's done, and I think Mackie Raven's here today, has done a series of studies around the country on, on, on charters. But the big national study basically shows that, oh, something on the order of 25% um, percent of the charters do significantly better than their feeder schools, the schools from which their kids come. Um, and about 29% do um, significantly worse. And the rest, in the 50% range, do just about the same. So this variability that we're, we've seen across um, charters and other forms of choice point out that there's other things that are important going on besides just whether or not you're a school of choice. And so <clears throat> a basic conclusion that we made then is that choice is um, not an end in itself. The goal is not to have choice. Choice has to be a means to an end. And as Linda pointed out, and I just noted in the Minneapolis example, um, choice can lead to greater or less access. It can lead to greater or more segregation. It can lead to better schools or worse schools. It depends on how it's managed, organized, supported, et cetera. So choice is not a magic bullet. Choice is just simply one means that we can utilize to get to the end. And the end, of course, is better schools. And what do those better schools look like? Well, they, there's no surprise here. When we look at successful schools of choice, they look like successful traditional public schools. That is, there is um, a, uh, a focus on personalized designs, that is, actually understanding where individual kids are and responding to their needs. Um, a, a high quality curriculum that is aligned with the standards and assessment in that particular jurisdiction. And then a big focus on the recruitment, retainment, and support of the educators in the building. So I'm just going to go over sort of our four big takeaways from, uh, from the study. The first one is that we, as we think about building systems of high quality schools that are accessible for all families, the first thing one needs to do is to focus on the kids, not the adults, and how they govern one another. Okay, And I'll give an example here of uh, Jonathan Raymond, who's going to be on one of our panels in, in, um, when he first came to Sacramento. Jonathan came to Sacramento, and you can tell me if I'm, I'm wrong here, and he didn't say we need a certain percentage of charter schools in the district, or we need, uh, we need two Waldorf schools and one of these schools and one of those schools. Rather, what he did is he came in and he listened to the community. He gathered data about what the, um, what the community needed, and they asked for, for example, a Waldorf school, and they asked for some other, other things. Um, he um, then tried to build a system of schools that were in response to that need, which meant making decisions, it was a tough budgetary time, about closing schools in ways that didn't leave any particular neighborhood without access to a high quality school. And so at the end of the day, he ended up with a system of schools that were focused on developing high quality learning environments um, instead of a set of independent charters who just sort of like ran around and did whatever they wanted to do. Um, the next issue is um, how does one ensure equity and access for all kids? And there's lots of um, different ways to do it. One that I mentioned in Cambridge is to control choice, to make sure that as you allow families to choose, you ensure that that in, um, leads to greater integration rather than segregation. Um, a second way to do it is to standardize the enrollment process. This is something like, for example, has been done in Denver, so that families don't have to find five or six 
different schools and try to figure out what their application process is and what the dates are, et cetera, but rather they can go through one central portal to try to find out, to understand what, what schools they can apply to. Um, another issue that um, Robin Lake may talk about, um, CPRI's done a lot of work in this area, is that when schools lose students for whatever reasons, they have to backfill with students from their waiting list or from new students who moved into the district so that schools don't become more and more specialized over time, which has happened. Um, established common disciplinary uh, systems. Here in DC, when charters first got off the ground, um, one of the findings was that students were being suspended at a much higher rate in charters than in the traditional public schools. And so DC took some steps to address that and tried to develop a more common system and more centralized system for disciplinary um, procedures so that you don't get this different results in different places and student, certain kind of students pushed out of schools of choice and back into the traditional public schools. Um, and then the issue of how to support and incentivize schools to serve the neediest students. Linda mentioned in New Orleans, New Orleans with special ed students at the, when charters first got going were, um, was a real issue. Students couldn't get into charters. Charters were arguing that, well, they didn't really have the, serve, you know, the support system to provide these kids. And so, the, so the, the, the school system there has recently made some efforts, and Robin uh, has written about this, to incentivize schools and provide extra supports to them so that they can start to serve those kids. And then a third issue is the issue of transparency. Not all families have access to easy access to the social um, networks that allow them to understand what the school system looks like. So you have places like Denver and in Massachusetts where they've stepped out uh, very aggressively with campaigns to get information into, into families' um, hands. Gathering common data so that you're able to, you're able to look at um, schools as apples to apples and you don't have to you know, look at this report on that school and that report on that school. Um, and then ensuring financial transparency. This is a big issue in many districts. Um, some schools of choice get a lot of resources from outside of the traditional district channels or from the state. And making that clear to parents is an important um, factor. And then um, making it clear how it is that students get assigned fr from school to school. And then our final lesson is you know, how to build a system of schools for all. Leaving no school behind. That is, in some district, what happens is there's a lot of effort to focus on sort of these new, interesting, innovative uh, schools of choice. And the traditional public schools are, if you will, left behind. And so what you find in good systems of choice, and Denver would be an example of this, District 4 that Linda mentioned in, in New York, um, are places where they have not just tried to have choice and innovation, but they've supported all schools. And there's different ways to do it. One of them is to provide common professional development for teachers and <clears throat> leaders in, in the district, whether or not they're in a school of choice or not. Um, another one is to establish a common way of providing qualitative as well as quantitative data on how well schools are doing. That's, again, common across all, um, all, all schools, whether or not they're schools of choice. And then the other one is the whole issue of wraparound services and whether or, and the, whether or not there shouldn't be a centralized way of providing schools with the extra supports like nurses, counselors, et cetera, that meet the needs of those um, school students, regardless of if they're a, a school of choice or not. Um, these are all ways of, that we're thinking about how one can build, again, a system of schools in which all students have access to high quality and all schools are of high quality. And here's where we can reach the report. Thank you. And so now Linda's going to. All right. We are going to continue to just plow on ahead. Um, our first panel takes up the question of the possibilities and challenges of choice. 
And I was reflecting on the fact that my own experiences with choice as a parent and an educator really do hold up a lot of the possibilities and challenges of choice. And we're going to hear from a number of folks about those. But when my uh, children were very young, we lived in Montgomery County, Maryland. Who's here from Montgomery County? I'm sure there's Montgomery County in the house. Um, <laughs> and you may know that there are schools of choice in uh, Montgomery County, the communications arts magnet and the math and science magnet and so on. We lived in Tacoma Park. And so uh, we were actually in the neighborhood for the um, <clears throat> Tiny Branch School and the Tacoma Park Elementary School where they had a math uh, magnet. And I went, went into school with my first daughter, uh, walked through the hallways and there were a set of classrooms that were almost all white and a set of classrooms that were mostly students of color because it was at that time a predominantly black um, area of the county, and uh, they had very different curricula. So in one set of classrooms, kids were just memorizing math facts to spit them back on a multiple choice test. The other one, they were doing a very thoughtful um, math for understanding curriculum that I actually had seen before because a friend of mine developed it for kids in St. Louis. Uh, and I went to the principal, I said, well, I'd like my ch child in that classroom. She said, oh, oh, can't get into that classroom, that's for the highly gifted. They had a gifted program which brought white students into this predominantly black school um, and a highly gifted program for the math which went all the way up to the math and science magnet at the junior high and the high school. And so I said, well, this curriculum should be for all kids. This you know, wasn't developed for the highly gifted, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they finally let my daughter take the test because they could see a squeaky wheel. <laughs> you knew a squeaky wheel when they saw one. She became the first black student in the magnet, went all the way up through the junior high school and the high school. By the time they got to the junior high school, in the magnet of 100 kids in the school of 1,000 kids, they had computers on every desk. This was many years ago. They had uh, very highly qualified teachers, some of them with PhDs. They were taking algebra in seventh and eighth grade. In the entire rest of the school, there was not a single credentialed math teacher who could teach algebra in the junior high school. And that is still very much the same way that magnets operate in Montgomery County today. So there you've got the possibility of integration and you've got the challenge of a very, very highly defined tracking system that reinforces segregation. When I went to New York City uh, at Teachers College, I worked with a lot of educators who were creating all these new small schools, and I saw these amazing possibilities for spectacular schools that uh, were you know, meeting the needs of a wide range of kids, many of them well integrated, uh, and uh, I, the, the degree of innovation, the degree of success with children uh, that was happening as part of that uh, choice opportunity, which the <clears throat> chancellor had brought and multiple chancellors maintained, uh, was spectacular. But there were many challenges, and we're going to be joined on the next panel by Claire Sylvan, who lived through some of those challenges, with kind of fighting for all of the freedoms and autonomies that were necessary to maintain those schools. So, you know, challenges and possibilities. Uh, when I came to California, uh, Palo Alto, uh, where Stanford is located, is right across the highway from East Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. East Palo Alto was a 100% black district for many years. It's now predominantly Latino, some African American and Pacific Islander students. Palo Alto, 80% of the people are college educated. East Palo Alto, 8% of the people are college educated. They had lost their high school in desegregation. And the kids were all being bussed out to surrounding districts. Two thirds of them were dropping out. Superintendent of the elementary district called up and said, can you help us put a high school in our district in the community so kids are not bussed out and enable them to be able to succeed? That was started as a charter school because that was the only way that an elementary school district could start a high school. <clears throat> so here you see the possibility of charters. Uh, we did all kinds of work around both uh, you know, I brought everything I had learned in New York <laughs> into that school, and a lot of the people uh, came and helped us. Uh, ultimately, we had a school with 90% graduation rate, 90% of the kids going on to college, doing project-based learning and exhibitions and social-emotional supports and community school and so on. Uh, but it was very hard to sustain that school, and it really should have been a district school. 
Uh, so we tried to get it back in the district. The district didn't actually want that school because it served the highest need kids and it would have brought their average test scores down to have that in their accountability count. So again, you see the possibilities and you see the challenges of choice. Uh, and finally, we did a study while I was uh, at the Scope um, Center at Stanford of Milwaukee schools, which was the first district of school choice, which had vouchers and charters and contract schools and district schools and all kinds of schools. And uh, lots of possibilities. Some great schools were created. Some innovations occurred. But over two decades, there was no improvement in student achievement in Milwaukee. And it finally took uh, a superintendent who was working with us as part of a, uh, a district leadership program, uh, Bill Andrikopoulos, who said, I'm going to try to improve achievement in this district. And he tried to put in place some instructional supports, like those that Tony Alvarado had done in uh, District 2 in New York, um, all kinds of work around literacy, around math, and so on. And he did finally move the needle on achievement. But it was very difficult in a system of autonomous choice to get people together to do anything in common uh, around instruction. Uh, and after he left, it kind of fell back uh, to where it was. So possibilities and challenges of all kinds of choice are things that regardless of where you sort of start in this conversation, we have to contend with if we actually want good children, uh, education for kids. So with that introduction, I want to introduce our spectacular panelists for this uh, session. You can read their bios in your packet. But uh, to my left, and that might be a political statement, I don't know, is the, uh, it's kind of hard to get to my left, but um, <laughs> the acting dean of the University of District of Columbia, uh, David A. Clark School of Law, John Britton. John has been litigating around these issues for a very long time. He joined the UDC law faculty in 2009. He's a tenured professor of law there. He's been president of the National Lawyers Guild, uh, leadership roles at the NAACP, the ACLU, and responsible for uh, really theorizing and activating litigation around interdistrict uh, choice for desegregation. Dr. Ashley Griffin is down the row. I'm going alphabetically here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Griffin is the director of P12 research at the Education Trust. Uh, she conducts primary and secondary research to inform decision makers at the national, state, and local levels, and really has worked on equity issues uh, in a variety of ways for a long time. She served previously as the director of research and evaluation at the Capstone Institute at the great institution of Howard University. Uh, professor Luis Huerta, right here in the middle, is an associate professor of education and public policy at Teachers College, Columbia University. His work does examine policies around school choice reforms that advance both decentralized and market models of schooling. Uh, and we'll hear from him on the um, uh, extensive research that he has done in that area. <laughs> Professor Julie Mead, right here in our matching outfits, uh, <laughs> is the Associate Dean for Education and Professor at the Department of Education Leadership and Policy Analysis at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She uh, does work uh, about uh, on topics related to education law, and her recent scholarship has worked on how uh, charter schools can promote an equal educational opportunity. And then Professor Julian Vasquez Heilig, uh, Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies, Director of the Doctorate in Educational Leadership at Cal State Sacramento. He's also the Education Chair for the California NAACP. He is perhaps, I say this with a little trepidation, but uh -oh. he is perhaps the most energetic of my <laughs> former students. <laughs> and if you follow uh, Julian's <laughs> blog and uh, many, many activities, you'll see that he is always devoted to issues of promoting access, diversity, and equity. Uh, so with that start, I want to start with John Britton. John, you've participated in significant civil rights and education uh, litigation throughout your career, including before the US Supreme Court. Some of that work has addressed interdistrict choice. Uh, and I just wonder what your reflections are about how that uh, approach, the interdistrict choice approach, has been successful in furthering integration, uh, and in what ways have there been roadblocks to success? Thank you very much, Linda. You've just been sailing along this morning so far, so good. <laughs> and when Linda, darling, Hammond calls me, I come. <laughs> I 
am here to testify that the right choice does promote educational equity, particularly in promoting diversity and reducing racial isolation and segregation and leading to education. I have been a school diversity, school equity, school desegregation litigator for nearly 50 years. Wow. And I have a mantra. And you're only 39. I don't know. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> I know when my legal educational expertise on equality ends and my ignorance on sound education policy begins. As a result, I've always surrounded myself with educational experts like Linda Darling-Hammond, like Amy Stewart-Wells, like Peter Cookson, and the rest. And it's the type of knowledge and research that you have heard this morning that has formed my strategies and my efforts in the courts. When I was first invited to participate on this panel and the word choice came up, I was puzzled. Uh, many of you may share that same view. As the uh, research has pointed out so far in the introduction of this session this morning, and by the way, I'm so delighted to see a room full of people packed at 9 a.m. in the morning, sunny fall <laughs> weather, to talk about education and equity and choice. And so I came into Mississippi back in the 1960s as uh, so-called freedom of choice was rolling out. And you remember historically that freedom of choice was the first school assignment plan after the decision in Brown versus Board of Education, which the uh, segregated schools used. They dropped the de jure policy of assigning students to uh, schools on the basis of race. And they created what was known as freedom of choice. And under freedom of choice, the uh, students and their parents could choose whether to go to the, quote, black school or the, quote, white school. And 98% of the white students stayed in the white school, maybe 5 or 6 or 7% of the black students went to the white school. And the schools remained segregated. And it went all the way back up to the United States Supreme Court after Brown versus Board of Education. And they declared that that did not work. And they must have a real remedy, an effective remedy, to dismantle the vestiges of school segregation. And my next uh, involvement with uh, choice, as you've also heard, is that choice was one of the standard remedies in school desegregation cases. And it was a choice largely centered around the creation of magnet schools. So historically, magnet schools were created in order to uh, promote uh, diversity. Fast forward to the 1990s, I was uh, one of the lead lawyers in a major landmark school desegregation case in Connecticut called Sheff versus O'Neill. And uh, Sheff was one of the first state cases based upon a state constitution in state court instead of in federal court that found that the uh, de facto segregation between largely the urban and surrounding suburban school districts uh, violated the Connecticut uh, constitution. And today, all of this discussion about choice and choosing is a remedy. And all of the pursuit for educational equality today is about remedy. It's not about any liability of whether any school district did something to violate the law. Because even if they did, and even if they find him, then it's a second half kind of sports ball game in which the remedy is the key to success. Mm -hmm. And so in the Chef case, it was one of the first cases that ever held that the boundary line between the segregated urban district and the more diverse suburban districts was the cause of the unconstitutional segregation inside urban districts. It was a rejection of this so-called Milliken versus Bradley case around 1974 that said that there's no remedy for school segregation between urban districts and suburban districts in a case brought in federal court in which the remedy is to create these inner district plans. And the Milliken versus Bradley case, only 20 years after the Brown versus Board of Education case, held that the urban district cannot be involved in any remedy to promote diversity between the urban district and the suburban districts in a region unless the suburban districts were responsible for the segregation in the urban district, which they weren't. And the Connecticut case overcame that whole legacy and that old law. And the remedy was an inter-district remedy. The remedy also was a choice remedy. 
of, since 1965 and leading up to the decision of the <coughs> Connecticut Supreme Court in 1996, the Greater Hartford Area of Connecticut maintained a program called Project Concern. And this was a standard transfer, mainly of non-white children from the urban districts to a number of cooperating suburban districts that created seats for them. Bob Crane from Teachers College came in, conducted a study, and found the beneficial effects of this inter-district program. When we won the case, the state of Connecticut automatically expanded that program, and they called it CHOICE. It was then known as the CHOICE program for promoting integration. And it also created a number of inter-district remedies, which was mandated by the decision in the court, since the boundary line was the cause of the segregation. And it's led today of one of about eight to 10 very successful inter-district programs in which a set of magnet schools surround the borderline, and there are a number in Hartford, too. And then finally, I've been involved more recently in what um, you heard was control choice. And the godfather control choice is a longtime school desegregation planner named Michael Alves and Alves Consultants. And more recently, Richard Kallenberg, who's here in the audience from the Century Foundation, and I have joined with the ALP consultants, and we have designed school diversity choice programs based upon social and economic status. So from freedom of choice that was bad, to a choice inter district programs, to a choice diversity programs under control choice, these have been standard remedies to promote equity and diversity in K through 12 schools. And there will be a test. <laughs> You've just had a semester's worth of amazing history. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to ask, do you have uh, uh, some thoughts about what has been most uh, supportive of successes in this arena and where there have been challenges to overcome, you know? I think the success of control choice recognizes the reality that there are fewer successful schools that attract a wide range, social and economically, of parents, and a greater demand and excess of those successful schools from which parents may send their child. So therefore, you can't just create like Minnesota did and others a free choice that parents can choose any school available for them. There must be some control. So the key to the success until we reach this goal that you've heard of equity and access for of all schools performing at a high level for all parents, you have to have some control. And the control, in short, is based upon some algorithms, based upon some criteria such as the social and economic status of the parent, the educational ability of the child, built-in grandfather for any children existing in schools. And you can go down this line that the school board sets. And when they set this set of criteria, the system goes to work in a computerized fashion, and it gives parents three choices, the first, the second, and the third. You heard today that, in most cases, the actual assigned school. And by the way, this whole discussion about choice is the flip side of the coin in a standard educational administration of a school assignment plan. And the conventional school <coughs> assignment plan is the neighborhood schools. And that is <coughs> mandatory. And the Supreme Court has virtually upheld the local assignment to schools in neighborhoods where the parents and the children live. And that is also the problem. So the problem is mandatory assignment to built-in housing segregated communities, often in particularly urban areas, highly populated by a children eligible for free and reduced lunch, and by schools under the state standards of so-called achievement are performing below the state system. So some are trapped in those schools because there is no choice. Others find their way out, but there is no, as uh, the executive director pointed out near the end, effort to build every school up 
to the standard of quality in the district. Well, that's a great segue to what I want to ask uh, Dr. Griffin. Um, you uh, have been really looking at these issues of school design. You have a background in educational psychology. Um, what do you think are the particular elements of school design that public school options, whether they're magnets or charters or open enrollment programs, uh, need in order to promote quality and equity and to meet student needs, and perhaps in particular the needs of African American students, but really all students' needs? Um, that's a great question. I, I actually think your report does a great job of highlighting a few that really stand out to me, particularly in this space. I do want to add one thing in that one of the challenges around these issues of school design is really thinking about what choice means, like to your point, and how we define choice. So often parents have a choice between what's poor and poorer versus really high quality yeah. schools, period. And so what we know to have high quality schools is that we need school discipline policies that, that do not disproportionately impact black students in particular. Um, this becomes really important in our charter school spaces that are overly representing students of color. Um, and so we really want to think about how we think about restorative justice policies, how we think about really promoting social emotional academic development of students in those spaces. Um, we really want to think about the segregation within schools. And so your story uh, was so powerful because right, like we see today in Montgomery County and so many other places really um, awful situations where we have kids in the same schools where the numbers on the outside, where the district looks like, the chartered network looks like, it's totally diverse. We've got a good system of diversity happening. When we dive into those schools, mm -hmm. we actually see our barriers that are set up to limit black and brown and low-income students from accessing the right coursework and opportunities, the right curriculums, having access to diverse educators is something that we think is critical. So, so often we talk about diversifying students and ensuring students are diversified. But what about our leaders? What about the teachers and buildings? And that is so critical to how we think about, you know, we talk about wraparound services and whole child development, but these are spaces for both public and charter schools that are critical that we really need to think about and that we talk about a lot and in, in how we want to navigate our charter and public school conversations. Yeah. And you know, your point about having in place social, emotional, and academic development supports, restorative practices, gets us uh, to the kind of training that educators have Absolutely. as well, Absolutely. and whether they really know uh, how to do that in a productive way. Absolutely, that, that consistent, high quality, meaningful, and I would even say targeted professional development um, is what we need to happen in our school districts. We really think about not just the, the, just the pedagogy and the content, but building the social emotional academic of adults, right? Adults need to learn how to interact with students. They need to learn how to build their own social emotional and academic development as well so they can help students across mm -hmm. the board. We also know that when we think about how teachers give assignments, our, our ed trust work and our practice team has really been thinking around curriculum and assignments that teachers don't always realize how they're assigning kids work and if that actually aligns to the standards of high expectations or low expectations. And so we know we need to provide development to really help <coughs> teachers hone in and look at their assignments and think about am I inadvertently, maybe not on purpose, sending the lever or the bar or the notice that, hey, I'm giving you low expectations just because of the types of assignments I'm giving you. We really need to think about that and how those can then engage motivation and engagement in students across the board. Yeah. So it's a really great set of points. You know, we, we think about in the context of choice, the freedoms that schools want. Um, I'm always troubled by the notion that the freedom that some schools want is to hire teachers who have no training. And then what about the rights of students to be taught by somebody who knows what the heck they're doing? Yep. So, yep. That, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> Nothing else to say, but yep. <laughs> yeah. and so that, that's really a part of it. And I want to come to Professor Mead because you do a lot of work around um, the access of students with disabilities mm -hmm. to uh, you know, the, the kinds of schools that they need. And of course, that gets us directly to the issue of how uh, educators can serve those needs. And I wanted to ask you, you know, under what conditions uh, choice policies can really provide the right kind of supports for that group of students? Well, um, for children with disabilities, of course, and, and I'll give a much shorter, but a, a little hint, hint of, <laughs> of uh, it's good to have professors here. on the panel. <laughs> we're going to get educated um, here. And because a lot of times when the issue of, of disability and choice comes up, there's an assumption made that that issue did not come up until the advent of charters. 
but actually right. that's not true. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a number of, um, for example, OCR investigations and reports uh, coming out in the early 90s. So we actually had that issue had been lit litigated in open enrollment programs, both inter intra and inter district programs, and in magnet schools before it happened in charter schools. Right. Um, and in all of those public spaces, if you look at all of that, as well as the, um, the way that the law was written in 1997 to readjust the, the, the fact that the landscape of public choice was changing by making it explicit what has to happen when charter schools are involved, there are four kind of general rules, if you will, that apply in, at least in those <coughs> public forms of choice. So set aside vouchers for a moment, but in those public forms of choice. And that's that um, those choices must be accessible to children with disabilities. So accessibility first. Second, that parents cannot be required to waive services in order to get the choices that they want. Third, that FAPE or free appropriate public education must be available in all of those spaces. And then um, finally, that the state, and because federal law puts the onus on the state to ensure FAPE in all of its programming, that the state has to decide where the responsibility lies. So in, in terms of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, we call that the LEA or the Local Education Agency. So the state has to decide, for example, in an inter-district um, choice program, when the child transfers, who's responsible for ensuring that that child gets what they need if the child has a disability or, or, or disability manifests itself after, after the move. Is it the resident district or is it the receiving district or the, the chosen district, if you will? Most have picked the latter as opposed to the former, but they have to decide. Um, and the same is true in, um, for example, independent charters that don't have a connection to a school district. Who is the local education agent for that school? Because all of that creates accountability measures. And so what all of that says together is that you have to think about these, these issues both with regard to children with disabilities but with regards to including all kinds of learners that has to be a design principle at the start. Mm -hmm. So it must be a design principle when the state is creating the law that, that allows these choices in the first place, mm -hmm. or if the choices are created within a district, the policies within those districts, and even the charter school authorizer. So even if you have a state that doesn't have many parameters around what a charter authorizer gets to do or must do, the charter authorizer itself can set up a series of principles to ensure that. And that holds folks accountable, whether whatever kind of system we're of choice we're talking about, through the kind of the, the process. And if you were talking about charter schools specifically, that means that you have to think about the entire charter school cycle, if you will. So you have to think <coughs> about what do authorizers have to look at and what standards should they hold people to when they're reviewing a proposal. What must be in a proposal? If the proposal is selected then to have that school develop a contract, what kinds of things must be in that charter itself or the charter contract? What kinds of things are non-negotiables in that, those, those spaces? Then we move, of course, to, to oversight and operation. What kinds of data must be looked at by the authorizer as they're reviewing um, what's happening in the school to determine um, whether or not a, a school is meeting its the standards that we hold as a public policy for inclusivity. Um, and then in terms of, of course, the, the big tools of, of revocation, renewal, and non-renewal decisions. All of those have to ha pay attention to those things at the outset. And, and, and again, remember that these are all policies constructed by people. So that means we can construct them in ways that work and that all, like all of these policy instruments, they're only as good as the ways they are wielded. And if you want to think of another way, only as good as we have created safety measures to ensure that they're being wielded that way. Mm -hmm. So, and those are, go uh, along with all of those um, different kinds of controls that we have to think about as we're looking at how those um, systems evolve. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of charter school laws, for example, 
all of them have near, that that I all of them that I've looked at I should say a little qualifier there but um, have non-discrimination language in there but often it's just a statement of the schools will not discriminate and that is certainly a necessary element but I would argue that it's insufficient because it doesn't go far enough to think about that whole cycle and holding folks accountable right. for those systems. and earlier I mentioned Massachusetts which has paid some attention Right. to this issue in its cycle and in the way that it enforces the law and, exactly. and so on. Are there other places that you would point to as um, particularly thoughtful or um, I, committed I, around this sort of I, issues? I would agree that that is, is the one that I would point to. And, and so it, there is a little bit of irony here, right? right. Because um, <laughs> the part of the, the war interview where the argument for um, charter schools was to create autonomy without with a different kind of oversight so not autonomy without oversight but shifting if you will the general oversight through state law and state regulation to the particular oversight through that charter school contract well you can see in that shift how good that accountability is is going to be highly dependent on what's in that charter contract that particular set of accountability measures and how well those are enforced by whoever is the authorizer on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the irony, of course, is in the places where there seems to be the um, highest quality, at least in my view, are those places that are not as autonomous. And the places that are more autonomous are the way, places that I think that we're having more trouble. Or maybe so another way to think about it is where do the autonomies <laughs> Yeah, which where, autonomies where are most important? Exactly, and which, uh, and, which, and things which are, are, are part of the accountability structure? Well, I want to turn to um, Julian uh, Vasquez Heilig, who um, is, as I mentioned, the education chair for the California NAACP, and um, put that hat on for a moment. Okay. <laughs> Uh, two years ago, uh, or was it three, the NAACP issued a much publicized moratorium on public charter schools that um, uh, followed concerns about access uh, as well as treatment of some students. Uh, and then uh, the organization then held hearings throughout the country to hear different points of view. What did uh, the NAACP learn in that process and what kind of recommendations came out of that? Excellent, excellent. First, I want to know, are there any other Californians here? Because I want to know if it's still 4.30 in the morning for us. <laughs> okay, just want to check that. So I'm going to be speaking from uh, the High Quality Education Task Force report. I'm going to try to use my notes here so that I can stay true to uh, what the report recommended. So there was a few action items uh, on charter schools and choice that came out of that 2016 moratorium uh, resolution, which actually originated uh, in California. As you know, mm -hmm. uh, the NAACP is a very democratic organization. These resolutions come up from local units, up to the state, and then on to the national. So the first uh, is about uh, creating uh, and enforcing robust accountability measures, specifically related to authorizers. And I think Dr. Mead has plowed this ground uh, <laughs> really well. But one of the recommendations is, and if you, if you look back to Shanker's original vision, uh, is that districts primarily serve as the authorizers. Now, mm -hmm. in California, so I have, I have two children, and when they want candy, they first come to me and say, Dad, can I have some candy? And I'll say, no, no candy. And then they'll go to Mom, and they'll say, <laughs> Mom, can I have some candy? And Mom will say, no. So then what my kids do is they go to the neighbor's house and ask if they can have candy. <laughs> well, that's how the authorizing process works in California, uh -huh. is that uh, charter schools can go authorize their shopping. Once yeah. if, if, if the district doesn't want to say yes to them, then they can go to the county, and then they can go to the state board. And actually, the State Board of Education has almost a 40% failure rate for the charter schools that they approve. Uh, so that's uh, the first thing. And then second is a, is a common uh, and create a common accountability system. One of the things that we're very fortunate to have in California is we, we have I, what I see as a secondary accountability system called the LCAP. And the LCAP looks at a wide variety of, well, it's a multiple measure way of thinking about the success of students who are from foster backgrounds, from uh, EL backgrounds, from low SES backgrounds. But one of the challenges that we've had in California is getting uh, uh, um, uh, charter schools to make that information publicly available. So holding everybody uh, to the same standard. Also requiring and uh, charter schools to admit and retain all students. This is a challenge that was talked about in New Orleans in the research uh, mm -hmm. that Dr. Linda Ellingham has done. 
Kevin Wellner did a really interesting uh, piece in the Teachers College Record talking about the dirty dozen, 10, uh, 12 ways that charter schools are able to cream and crop mm -hmm. their students. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this in the national data. If you look at uh, the numbers of, low, of uh, special education students, English language learners across the nation, uh, they're, they're, they're less in, in charter schools. Um, also, uh, creating and monitoring uh, disciplinary guidelines. If you, uh, the Civil Rights Project wrote a report about this, uh, that charter schools are about 17% more likely uh, to uh, discipline uh, their kids. Uh, and one of the ways that DC uh, sought to address this was by creating a large school, a large scale data system that monitored expulsions and disciplinary infractions. Uh, one of the challenges with charter schools uh, writ large is that they take some of the problems that we already have in our traditional public schools and make them worse. More segregated, higher disciplinary rates. Uh, if you look at the predominance of the research literature, I think you would come away with that conclusion. Uh, also require charter schools to hire certified teachers. In California and other places, there are loopholes that they can hire uh, teachers who are not fully certified. I have a podcast called Truth for America. I did a, an interview uh, with a charter school teacher uh, from Los Angeles. And uh, the charter schools really need special education teachers. And I asked him, well, what sort of training did you have uh, to teach special education in Los Angeles? He said I had about five hours of training hmm. over the summer to do that. Mm -hmm. okay? And I asked, well, did the parents of your special ed students know that you basically know nothing about special education, had never written an IEP? He said the parents absolutely did not know that. Mm -hmm. And so that's a real uh, challenge. We need to ensure that every school, especially those schools, and we, and we know from Linda's past research that uh, students of color and low SES students are more likely to be assigned uh, teachers who are uh, uncertified. Require fiscal transparency uh, and, and accountability and equity. Uh, there was this uh, story uh, in, in California just last week. This charter school went out of business. But before it went out of business, it bought the charter school for $3 million then sold it to a leasing company, mm -hmm. and over time spent $7 million in leasing money. When that school closed, those folks walked away with a $4 million profit. Mm. And so we really need to be thinking about uh, this fiscal transparency uh, and accountability uh, for all schools. Uh, and then also eliminate for-profit charter schools. Is Betsy DeVos in the room? <laughs> um, you know, as we know, more than eight, I grew up in Michigan, Lansing, right here in the middle of my hand. Uh, more than 80% of the <clears throat> schools uh, charter schools in Michigan are for-profit. Uh, the National Authorizing Association says they have the worst uh, transparency and accountability in that state. The predominance of the research literature says that for-profit schools underperform. In fact, included in that umbrella are the online charter schools. Mm -hmm. Recognizing this, the Charter School Association of California turned uh, themselves around on this particular topic. Three years ago, they were okay with for-profit schools. And Jerry Brown was saying that, I'm not convinced that for-profit schools are problematic. Well, this last month, Jerry Brown and Charter Schools Association came together with folks, and for-profit schools were banned in California. So uh, that's a, uh, I think that's a positive step forward. Well, that's a good segue to uh, Professor Huerta, <laughs> who's actually studied this question. So um, let me ask you to say a word about um, what uh, you found uh, in multi years of studies about both for profit schools and something that goes often with that is virtual for profit schools. Right. Um, first, good morning, and thank you, Linda and Peter, for inviting me in, in to LPI as well. So I'm honored to be here. Um, so thanks, Jill. I was actually wondering how this was going to be integrated into this discussion because virtual schools is, and a lot of the for profit and the profiteering that goes on in virtual schools. Uh, is a little bit of the, the ugly underbelly that even charter advocates have for many years wanted to try to shake. And it's sort of this wart that they've had to deal with. Um, and it's not until recently that they've actually um, been quite vocal and explicit that um, they're okay with these schools going away. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so just a little bit of backdrop from where I come from this perspective. I actually stumbled upon the virtual school space uh, in my first research project in graduate school starting in 1996 when I was traveling up and down the state um, in my first uh, empirical study as a, as a graduate student looking at how charters, early charters, 1996, four or five years into the movement, how they were experimenting with whatever decentralized freedoms they interpreted were provided to them under the charter school laws. Interestingly, one of the first charters we visited was a homeschool charter school in, right in the middle of California. 
This was a school that the district was a very, very small district, had about uh, 300 kids enrolled in about in a K-8 school. However, it had over 1,000 kids enrolled in a homeschool. Uh, now, this was publicly sanctioned homeschooling, which over time evolved into the virtual school space that we now talk about. Now, in 1996 in California, there were fewer than 100 school, charter schools operating. There were about 70, I think. But over half of the, popul of the total population of charter school kids in California in 1996 were actually in homeschool charter schools. The state at that point, with a very limited staff of the charter school office at the state level, because I think the state re thought maybe in four years the charter school experiment was going to evaporate, so they didn't really staff a charter school office at the state level, but the state was not aware that over half the kids in charter schools at that point were operating in homeschool environments. And, and the, the roots of this to talk about is important because those schools were operating with little to no accountability. In other words, traditional private homeschoolers were still allowed to operate as traditional private homeschoolers, whether that was prioritizing religious instruction or so forth, but this was all with taxpayer dollars. Now, the bigger issue was that the district that authorized this homeschool charter was reaping the benefits of all the dollars, the per people revenue that was coming into this district. So serving homeschool kids doesn't require brick and mortar, doesn't require facilities, transportation, food services, a nurse, et cetera. Uh, so the profit that these districts were able to make by sponsoring these schools and all of a sudden expanding their school population to four times what it was previously was an enormous windfall for these districts, a fiscal windfall. Fast forward, the, a lot of these schools evolved into virtual schools. And, and the virtual school space today, we see about, about 300 full-time virtual schools nationwide. Um, the majority of those are in the charter school space. Um, but more than 60% of kids in virtual schools today are in schools that are operated by for-profits, mostly K-12 Inc., uh, which is the large one. You probably see the commercials on TV. They even have a NASCAR mm. racing team. Mm. Uh, <laughs> purple, yellow, really ugly paint scheme. If you look at it. Um, funded not, by public tax dollars. Funded by public tax dollars. Uh, <laughs> Connections Academy is another, is another big one. Those two companies, those two for-profit companies, dominate over 60, or they actually have 60% of the market share of students in this space. Um, K-12 Inc., for example, has annual profits of about $30 million with revenue flows of over $100 million. And, and Connections is, is, has a very similar sort of profit margin. Now, as these schools have expanded, one of the issues that, from the, from the, issues, from the governance and accountability perspective, is that states have really struggled with how to hold these schools accountable. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've studied in my own work is how is it that states are trying to limit some of the profiteering, or if at all, if they're trying to do that, um, and address some of these accountability issues with regards to the amount of revenue that should be flowing to these schools. For example, if virtual schools are able to educate kids more efficiently for less money, then the question becomes, well, then why should those schools be receiving the same level of per people revenue as a brick and mortar kid? That's right. So there's a, there's a few states that have sort of, sort of uh, attempted to limit funding to these schools and make a more pro and provide a more appropriate level of revenue to these schools. However, there hasn't been a very concerted or uh, real effort in trying to limit this funding. California has tried this. Kansas has tried to do this a little bit. But there's a lot of gray. Uh, and most, for the most part, these schools are still receiving the same level of per people revenue. Um, the other issue around governance is also how do you count virtual school kids? Uh, uh, daily enrollment is often through an algorithm where kids are, you know, how many times they tap a keyboard. Uh, and the software is able to account for, you know, how, whether a kid is actually on task. And if they're able to show that they're on task by clicking the keyboard, regardless of whatever it is they're doing, um, that is <laughs> sufficient to account for their daily attendance. Uh, and that's then sufficient for that school to claim that that kid was enrolled for that day. But one of the tricky issues with attendance on virtual schools is that the accountability of how we account for virtual school kids is virtual. It doesn't necessarily <laughs> exist in most states. And this is a, this is a space that many states have struggled with as well, because what we see is that um, it's very different to account for this enrollment. And more importantly, the profiteering motives of a lot of the for-profit schools have really exploited 
the freedoms that are allowed under, mm -hmm. under, this, under this model. Um, what, one of the things that we see that's very, very common is enormous enrollment size in a lot of these schools. We know that the for-profit virtual schools are usually about three or four times the size of the virtual schools that are operated by, by local districts that are not in the charter school space. Um, and we see that um, the churn rate or the dropout rate in a lot of these schools averages around 45 or 50 percent. I was just speaking with a reporter here in D.C. There's a virtual school here in D.C. that has about 200 kids. Um, they report high levels of attendance, and they actually pride themselves on their attendance. But if you look at their numbers, they have an over 50% churn rate, or every year they are turning 50% of their students. So they may start with 200 kids in September, 50% of them drop out during the year, but then they finish the year with either the same amount or more because they're able to replenish those kids. So there's an enormously high level, high dropout level in these schools. The tricky part is figuring out whether this school has claimed attendance for all the kids who have dropped out because many of these kids may be coming from other places. And it is up to the home district from where these kids come to actually claim that Johnny, who was enrolled in this virtual school, actually dropped out in October, but yet the virtual school charged us all the way till May. Uh, and this is something that's been happening in Pennsylvania, Ohio, California, and a lot of other places. Um, because the onus for proving enrollment is not on the school that enrolled the kid, but on the district who that's sent right. the child, or who's sending the revenue to that, to that school. Um, so the profiteering margins here are quite high. With regards to issues of governance of teacher quality and instruction, um, there's, are there are a few states who have attempted to create statewide professional development and trying to uh, bring teachers up to sp speed in how to integrate technology into their classroom. But there is no state effort, there is no state who has actually engaged a concerted effort in trying to create a model for what quality virtual school, virtual instruction should look like. Uh, nor is there any state that has created any sort of certification process for what virtu quality virtual schooling should look like. So there's a lot, there's, there's this level of of uh, opaqueness here in how these schools operate, which is one of the reasons why it's also very difficult to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Now, insofar as moving forward with recommendations on how we might improve this space, the biggest issue is accountability. There, there is virtually no accountability. Uh, and legislators have to address the fiscal issue. You know, or should these schools be receiving the same level of revenues? They have to address how to, how to govern attendance patterns and how to govern and define uh, daily attendance. They also have to address this issue of um, size as well. You know, again, some of these schools on average are, are, are uh, engaging over 2,000 kids with an extremely high per, uh, teacher pupil ratio, sometimes as high as 100 to one or even higher. 250 to one, I've yeah, seen. So. Uh, by the way, this, the school that I told you about at the very beginning, 1996, mm -hmm. they had a ratio of nine, they had two teachers for 1,800 kids. Mm -hmm. So they had a 900 to 1 teacher ratio. Yeah. Uh, and that was very common in California. Well, and this, of course, is related to the fact that about 40% of the kids who attend these schools graduate, which is about right. half the graduation rate. Right. And that's the last piece I'll, I'll talk about. And the, and the, the achievement and We're the, wrapping up in the achievement one or, uh, uh, evidence for these schools is, is dismal. And they are, they are consistently on the bottom right. scoring of, mm -hmm. of these schools. So, so when we hear about claims of efficiency, we have to weigh that against issues around what, what their outcomes are, not only just with regards to student achievement, but also what it is they're doing with the full amount of per people revenue that they're receiving, even though their costs are significantly different, much lower than a brick and mortar kit. So we've kind of gone through the whole panoply of kind of <laughs> possibilities and challenges here, but our next panel really is gonna deal with the questions of um, how uh, districts and states have developed strategies and solutions to provide high quality choice uh, you know, within all of these sectors uh, uh, in which choice is available. Uh, so I want to transition us to that panel. I was going to uh, ask for uh, t time for audience questions, but we, we have, do we have time? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were giving me the I thought I was getting the hook, but I'm so glad that that's not the case because. <laughs> so I am going to ask for audience questions, and I see one right over here, uh, and we've got a microphone coming to you. 
Uh, terrific. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lindsay Tepe. I work in Senator Murray's office on the Help Committee. And I guess the question- Hard to I, hear you, so hold the sorry. mic up. Um, my question for you all is really focused on the issue that you're bringing up around choice working with accountability guardrails. And I think if you look at the parallels in the higher education sector, we mm -hmm. see that we have a system of choice and it doesn't always work <coughs> well. And part of the issue is that those guardrails aren't always working well. And then you see that the current administration is really working to take away those guardrails. And I would just like each of you um, in the areas that you're talking about to reflect on the fact of is it worth setting up a system that isn't going to work at all as soon as you take away those guardrails? Or should we have some other sort of system that isn't so, I guess, dependent on regulation or the kind of assurance that people are going to continue to keep those guardrails in place? So our system without the regulations would be a system of prayer? Uh, <laughs> what, what, what might that be? <laughs> Uh, does anybody want to take a stab at that? Well, I'll, 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 I'll take action. a little stab. What, what I would say is that, um, not to get too pedantic again, but you know, since if you were at Madison, you could come take my school law class, and what I would take you through is all the litigation, Brown and other kinds of cases that were really put guardrails on our public system because our traditional public schools lacked guardrails too. Um, and so we have we've learned over a, a long series of, of time that that when left to our own devices, perhaps we don't pursue our better angels, right? We don't follow them. And some of the things that exacerbate problems bubble up in that space we call school. Um, and so I think the the important thing to think about is, at whatever level, what, how are we engineering these systems to be as inclusive and as high quality as possible? And I think from the federal government, how do you incentivize that kind of design? How do you think about that in ways that are going to reward the best and discourage the worst? Yeah. Ashley wanted to say. I was going to go in a super slightly different direction, which is I think we need to understand better the why of like, because of all the variability and how this is happening across mm -hmm. the country, it'd be really interesting to understand, I am a researcher, and understand the why. Like, why are certain authorizers doing this better or in a, in a different way that is impacting students in a different way, impacting the system in a different way? I think that there is a lot still to understand about why. This report seems like a good, great step in that direction. But I do think, um, I think you might have sent it, Linda, around what is the why? How do we understand um, what's working? Is there is there a space where accountability is a good thing and around what do we need to place that accountability to, to have the, the best impact? I think there's some work still to be done there before we just completely jump all the way in. So. You know, one of the things that uh, I noticed, I've done some international studies. The most recent book is called Empowered Educators. Uh, a previous one was the flat world in education. Mm -hmm. In other countries, there are two things that get centralized if they're high achieving countries. One is equitable financing of schools. Yep. Mm -hmm. So all the schools are getting you know, either the same amount of money or there's more going to schools that have uh, kids who are new immigrants or you know, uh, have greater needs. Uh, and so that uh, centralized funding then gives people, I mean, part of the issue we're talking about here has to do with the way the funding operates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing they do is they train all educators intensively, extensively, for free, uh, and, and there's a base then of competence across all types of schools and all kinds of governance structures that you can rely on. And if we had those two pieces working really well, mm -hmm then you would need less regulation of uh, or micromanagement of what people do inside those structures. And I think uh, we have to think about how uh, equitable funding and uh, investments in competence are part of the accountability that then enables more autonomy, yep. enables more uh, diversity and innovation. Luis. So I, I just wanted to and preach it to the choir here, but everybody knows, remembers that uh, equity is not a market value. And I think that what's happened is, over time, 25 years of choice mechanisms, more than 25 years, um, 
is that the market perspective has really dominated this space mm -hmm. today. Um, and I gave you some examples with the virtual schools, but in charter schools, we see a dominance of education management organizations or charter management organizations that, that, are, that have the majority of kids. They are competing with each other. Now, market competition was in tandem together with local empowerment, the two main objectives of choice as, we, as, these, as these policies evolved in the very early 90s. Mm -hmm. But the idea of local empowerment has eroded. I wanna believe that you know, through decentralized, decentralizing public authority to local actors, there still is the possibility to create schools that are unique to those neighborhoods. However, the ability to do that has been dominated by the very competitive market of management organizations for profits and nonprofits. And we've lost sense of trying to empower families and uh, teachers at local levels to actually engage in whatever those unique forms of education are. Um, but instead, we're caught up in trying to uh, figure out how to manage the monster that has evolved with regards to the market approach to, to uh, public schooling. Yeah, and I will say that if you look at the laws that differ across states, that that market orientation drives some uh, states' laws and regulations and uh, does less so in other states. So it's an, an interesting um, set of differences. Let me take another question if there is one. Yeah, right over here. On the, yes. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Jenna Tomasello. I'm with the American Youth Policy Forum and also the co-founder of a new organization called Learn Together, Live Together, aimed at promoting school diversity and integration in the DC area and beyond. And my question is about the role of private schools in this conversation and maybe to a lesser extent homeschooling because as we think about how the system of choice is set up in the district, when we have upwards of 60% of white and affluent families choosing, um, choosing private schools, um, even, in a, even in an area where Unlike, uh, you know, John, thank you for bringing in Chef to this conversation, but, uh, you know, in an area where we have, we have residential diversity, um, but we're still not really able to achieve um, the sort of school diversity that we might want to see because we have, um, you know, folks exiting the public and charter school system. So I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. I'm wondering what the panel has to say about, about the role of uh, private schools as they are an option and a choice option for some some families. Thank really you. Really good question. Let me just um, sort of frame the conversation about uh, private school engagement in uh, the same way we've framed everything else, which is highly variable across the country. 9% uh, of kids generally are in private schools, which is actually a declining share. But you have places <coughs> like Washington, D.C., New York City is another one with very high private school enrollments. Who wants to take that on, Julian? So one of the reason why I didn't answer the last question is because I think my answer would be, might be too radical, so tweet at me and I'll, I'll respond. <laughs> oh, I um, so uh, I, on this one, I think one of our biggest challenges with market-based approaches to education is that they're segregating our schools even more. Mm -hmm. uh, and the research is showing that you know, African American parents choose schools that are even more segregated than the schools they're leaving. Same for white parents, a little less so for, for, for Latino, Latinx parents. Um, you know, I have a new study coming out that shows that if you look nationally, uh, you know, comparing charters and traditional public schools, if state, local, that, that they're, they're more segregated. So, you know, I was, I've been thinking about this, and uh, W.E.D. Du Bois, who was one of the founding, uh, founders of the NAACP, wrote a piece a long time ago that said, do, do Negroes need separate schools? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 1930 or, or around there. And mm -hmm. um, Myron Orfield and some other folks at the University of Minnesota convened a, a civil rights uh, uh, symposium, and they're gonna do another one here in DC uh, in January. And these, this was the, these were the central topics of that conversation. And so it's, I think it's impossible for me to answer this just in a couple of, of minutes, but I wrote a piece in uh, the Journal of Law and Inequality at the University of Minnesota that asked, do African Americans need separate schools? Uh, do they need separate charter schools? And we, we went through a lot of the recent cases, how the Supreme Court is thinking about this, parents, parents involved, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanna point you to that piece. Uh, uh, it's on academia.edu. I think this is one of the meta questions that we really need to ask. Uh, this, the same system that has segregated and stratified our society, that's the exact same system that we're using uh, to uh, in, in the market-based approach 
for schools. And I think we've, we've got to really think about that. And I think we have to say, you know, after what's happened uh, in the country over the last 24 to 48 hours, um, that this issue of how we bring people together uh, to have civil public discourse and to solve problems um, has to be treated in every imaginable way. And our willingness, I don't know if I would say willingness, but the fact that we have segregated, resegregated schools uh, so thoroughly in the last uh, 35 years, uh, you know, is associated with the fact that we have this divisive discourse that of the people who were uh, mailed pipe bombs over the last 48 hours, uh, half of them were African American or more, uh, with uh, attendant racial epithets and framings around the discourse that uh, accompanied the encouragement to do that. Uh, so we have to really think about these issues not just as technical issues of managing student assignments to schools, but also as fundamental issues for the nature of our democracy. And on that, now I am getting the hook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, we are going to uh, reconvene our next panel, which I think has just gone out the door and is probably going to come back in the door. So don't go away. Uh, we will be so welcoming them in one, one moment. Thank, thank this wonderful group. Of folks. <laughs>
practices, the tools that advance deeper learning experience and outcomes, especially for those furthest from opportunity. So the equity issue here is critical. As Linda said, I won't go through that again. She worked for LPI, and we miss her <laughs> terribly. Mohammed Chaudhry is the Chief Innovation Officer at the San Antonio Independent School District, where he develops and scales school design and turnaround initiatives. Previously, he served as the Interim Chief and Founding Director of the Office of Transformation and Innovation at the Dallas Independent School District. He began his career in education as a middle school English and second language teacher and social studies teach teacher in central Los Angeles. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I only know you from all your work, so it's great to see you in person. Uh, next, we have Robin Lake. Um, probably many of you know Robin in this audience and her work uh, at the uh, Center for Reinventing, where she director at the Center for Reinventing Public Education, a uh, nonpartisan research and policy analysis organization based at the University of Washington that develops transformative evidence-based solutions for K-12 public education. Her research focuses on U.S. public school system reforms, so there's the word system, including public school choice, charter schools, innovation scale, portfolio management, and effective state and local public oversight practices. So welcome, Robin. Thank welcome, Robin. We have Claire Silbin in the middle of, it, of our group here. We, we're so mixed up, we don't have any political orders this whatsoever. <laughs> I can't use that line. Um, it's very good to see Claire. Claire is the founder and uh, senior strategic advisor of the International Network for Public Schools and the co-founder and co-director of the Deeper Learning Equity Fellows. And that, I think we have someone. We have a few in the audience. Look at that. Can you put up your hand? OK. She's peppered the audience. All right, excellent. Um, uh, nationally recognized, she's, uh, Claire is a nationally recognized expert. Uh, and practitioner in school reform and the education of migrants, which is an English learners, and she's passionate about providing all students with personalized educational opportunities. Previously, Claire worked in diverse roles spanning public secondary education, teacher education, and community workplace organizing. Welcome, Claire. And, and, and now we have at the end of the line here, Jonathan Raymond, who is the uh, former president of the Stewart Foundation. He brings <laughs> insights very recently the former, I should say, okay. Uh, it brings insights from the many years of experience in education. First is the chief academic, uh, chief accountability officer at the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System in North Carolina, and then a superintendent of Sacramento City Unified School District from 19, 2009 to 2013. In his new book, Wildflowers, a school superintendent's challenge to America, he shares his insights into what we need to do to transform America's public schools. So we have, a, we have a fantastic panel. So let's get right to the questions so we can get going. And I should also say that to some degree, to the degree that we can, whoop, I'm going to, I'll just put this here. I'll, um, I'll try to get you guys all to interact with each other, all right? So feel free if you have something you want to um, uh, say. So Charmaine. I know, she said, I don't know how that much to say, but she has a lot to say. Okay. Much of this forum is the result of your thinking about what we call the tapestry of school choice. Can you describe what you mean by that and why you think it's so important to examine this tapestry and thinking of it as a framing for our, for our conversations about solutions and strategy? In what ways does this framing of the issue of choice point us in the direction of solutions and strategy? Thank you, Peter, um, and thank you, Linda and LPI, for having me. Um, when we first sat down to think about the various options of choice that were being thrown out, kind of without regard for quality, without regard for how they were actually impacting students' lives, the word tapestry just seemed to make sense because it came to me to think about it as, um, or surface the need for a purposely interconnected system of schools. I thought that was really important, a system of schools that's also worth choosing. Linda signaled that earlier. Um, they would be worth choosing because they would be equally resourced and equally supported based on, or I should say equitably, I don't say equal, yeah, equitably resourced and supported. I had this image of a quilt that one of my elders had made for me when I became a mom, and it symbolizes um, life periods of my life between middle school and motherhood. There's all these individual pictures. If you look at it, it's really intricate and it's beautiful. Any individual piece 
tells you something unique about my life, but it's not until you look at the whole piece or step back and look at it as a whole that you really begin to appreciate it and understand who I am in totality. And I like to think about that when we think about all of the choices, as opposed to thinking about charters and magnets, vouchers as this way of constructing public education, step back and think about what do families and schools and communities actually need? How can we design schools to be reflective of what families and communities and school and, and uh, children actually need? The design, the structure, thinking about it as a system and not as an individual collection of choices, not leaving choice at the individual's level because education or public education is still a public good. So stepping out and connecting those pieces and starting to orchestrate it and thinking of it as a system, which is why I thought of tapestry, it just seemed to make sense that we needed to connect the pieces more purposefully and not allow it to be so random. Well, that's, that's a great introduction, but I want to ask you just a little follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the word public good. Could, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because I think this is a key issue that we're really all grappling with. What is the public good in this context? The public good is, is our humans, it's our citizens. It's investing in the people who we ultimately expect to help run this country. We ultimately expect to help solve some of the challenges like climate change, cancer research, so many of those things are what we look to ourselves to actually do, but yet we don't invest in our people. So investing in the people to ultimately do on behalf of the country what is needed or what is best, that's what I see it as a public good. All right, that's, that was a great, great opening for us. I want to turn next to Muhammad because I think there's a lot of resonance what we've just talked about in your life and your work and your dedication and, the, and what you've done. In San Antonio, you've instituted a program to aid in increasing school integration using the strategy of control choice, which uh, Patrick touched on earlier in, in, in the meeting today. Could you tell us a little bit about what school choice, uh, control choice is and why you took this approach in terms of achieving more social, racial, and economic integration? There's, I have a follow-up question too, but just yeah. get started. Yeah. So where I would start is um, the system was designed to do, <coughs> I often say the system is designed to do exactly what it doing. San Antonio has 17 different school districts that make up the city, um, one city, right? A mayor who can't talk about San Antonio ISD, which is the urban core that we make up. Um, city council can't vote straight about education. That was all purposefully designed. Um, just talk to Richard Gross and he can tell you how the government sponsored all of that. So with that, I'm going to use big government to disrupt that and redesign it so we can fulfill the promise of integration. Um, either we're going to be okay with this notion, this uh, neo plessian notion of separate can't be equal, or we believe in the promise of Brown, and we're going to continue to fight for it. Um, now, as a teacher, as a student who grew up in high poverty schools, they can succeed, but they're damn hard to make work really well. We're going to be committed to that, but while we do that well, we're going to stop recreating it, especially when you're in an urban cities surrounded by affluence, right? Um, People often don't talk about attendance zones as choices. That's a market-based decision that leaves out a, a good chunk of people in this country. So let's talk about our attendance zones as well, but we don't want to do that, right? We can point to charters, we can point to private schools, but attendance zones have been segregating since the dawn of time, right? That's, I mean, it fulfills our original sin of segregation. So with all of that, what I would say is what we've done is we've decided that our we believe in best fit schools. We believe a student should not be trapped in an attendance zone that people have not taken the courage to redraw, right? Because we have suburban districts surrounding us with all sorts of affluence. And so with that, we use our industry charter process to launch a control choice initiative. And we're launching all sorts of school models from Montessori, from advanced learning academies, by the way, all of which are D-track. Right. I always laugh what Montessori has become nationally, right? Maria Montessori should be rolling in her grave, right? <laughs> um, and is. so <laughs> with all of that, um, we've launched our Controlled Choice Initiative around building socioeconomically diverse and integrated schools and racially diverse schools. And so the way we do that, because people often get worried about race and such, which by the way is still allowed, um, but it's, it's a myth that it's not. Um, we use something called socioeconomic blocks. Um, free and reduced price lunch, um, it's a flawed metric. We like it because we get federal funds, but if you really want to look at need and you want to get to students uh, who really deserve a choice and you want to guarantee choice, right, 
you, you've got to come up with a better measure of poverty. Uh, that work was inspired actually by Richard Kallenberg's work to help um, um, integrate the magnets in Chicago. And so basically what you do is you use census block data to find a way to measure socio socioeconomic capital um, around a child as well as the kinds of communities they're growing up. And so we looked at four factors from median income to levels of education to home ownership and single parent households. And then now I've added in the English learner uh, data as well to English language learner because we have to talk, think about how those families navigate choice as well. So with all of that, um, we created this block methodology and our families either live in block one communities and block four, block one being your more, more advantageous, that kid is more likely to be around kids who are educated or have parents or a friend who can call me and find me and try to get them off of the wait list. I say no to that often, right? That's not how that works. Um, <laughs> And block four being your least advantageous, less likely to own their home, less likely to know how to apply, et cetera. And so what we do with our control choice initiative is with these open enrollment campuses, we take two approaches. We do what I call a smarter and better attendance zone, which is like this priority radius approach, where say the school you wanna have, you wanna give, it was a former school that you reopened and you wanted a certain percentage to go to that neighborhood, so I would draw a radius around it. But when I draw that radius, I will capture million dollar homes, but I will also cut, capture subsidized housing. I'm not gonna make it look like the red line and attendance zones that we have in Dallas and San Antonio. And then when I go the rest of the district, I might do 50% eco dis, 50% non eco dis, and then I might do out of district. I do out of district in San Antonio because at the end of the day, it is one city and, and, and we're surrounded by it. And half of our employees even live out of district. So that's one way. And through that, we'll get schools that are at least 50% economically disadvantaged um, and then not economically disadvantaged. And we'll get students because I run something called an equity audit, which ensures that block three and block four students get in. Um, so if my recruitment strategy was engaging and powerful and it reached communities and it was easy to apply, then I should have a quarter of the eco dis side or economically disadvantaged side come from block three and block four families. If they don't, then I'll go to the wait list and I'll skip over and find the next block three and four kids and let them in. So that's our equity audit. Another approach we take is the straight 50-50 approach. 50% 50 of the students are gonna be eco dis and 50% of the students are not. And again, we'll have two lotteries, and then we'll do the equity audit piece. So all of that does promote socioeconomic diversity. Um, it does promote racial diversity. Why? Because the blocks track with race because of this country's ugly legacy of segregation. Um, unfortunately, it continually does. And then the other piece I would share is the work doesn't stop as soon as you have all the colors and all the incomes into the school. Integration, right, you wanna tap into pure effect, you better make sure your middle class families don't take over, right? So we do a lot of diversity and equity inclusion work as well in the campuses with our principal. These schools have performance contracts that look at achievement gaps and everything. So that's what we're doing in San Antonio. So I often say, if a Mohammed in Texas can talk about integration, <laughs> right? like, I don't want to hear your excuse. <laughs> Well, I have to, I have to say, uh, well, I'm sure I've got some questions at the Q&A period. How is this working politically in San Antonio? I mean, uh, maybe it's a little off topic, but I'm just so curious because <laughs> what you've done is so radically different than what was there before. So you have to own it. You have to use the word integration and segregation. Right, Mayor de Blasio knows that really well. Um, so <laughs> you, we, we, Pedro and I, well, first when Pedro Martinez hired me, I, he came from Chicago, I asked, you bring me on, we're gonna do desegregation. <laughs> do you believe in it? Absolutely. Uh, does our board believe in it? Absolutely. But we've never known how to go about it, right? So first comes with just making the case for it. But often people think like you have to come and undo attendance zones and deal with the pitchfork. You can start with one, right? <laughs> Actually, that was the theme of an interview I did with Serpy. You can start with one. Right, <laughs> and start with one and then scale, right? In Dallas, when fully grown out, the schools that we built, um, there's gonna be 8,000 kids in there, right? In San Antonio, when these schools are fully grown out, they're gonna be about 6,000 kids. When you start building on that concept, right, then the political tensions and such is dissolved. Because my middle class families 
and their self-proclaimed progressive values, they get, begin to practice them, they begin to have their play dates, they begin to have conversations about housing policy, and hopefully the world becomes a better place. And so, um, so you, you have to start with one and you keep going. Um, and you have to stand up, right? You have to stand up to middle class families when they tell you, well, why don't you just do this? Well, we want more seats, and you have to be willing to do that. Um, I mean, we're not afraid of white flight. I mean, that's what I'll say at the end of the day. Well, that was great. We'll come back to some of these issues. That was I tremendous. That. Well, this, this leads very much into uh, my next question to Robin. Um, Robin recently published a fascinating article for public school choice, focus on reality, not rhetoric, uh, in which you wrote, choice is not magic. It creates new possibilities and also new challenges. This is a little echo of the previous panel, but nonetheless, we'll look at it from a strategy point of view. What are the new possibilities and challenges that you see today? And I have a follow-up question for you as well. Great, yeah, um, thank you, Peter, and thank you um, to Linda and LPI for having me. Um, it's terrific that you all are working in this area. Um, the, um, yeah, so Peter, the article that you refer to, the Brookings piece was, um, built off of a series of studies we did in 18 cities around the country um, that have what we call kind of high choice, so across the spectrum, different kinds of choice, and understanding from data and evidence what's going on on the ground and how can we focus on the facts, not the, not the rhetoric. Um, and you know, just to step back, this is how we at SERPI have always tried to approach the choice problem. Um, I was recalling you know, through the earlier conversation this morning um, an article that Paul Hill and I wrote many, many years ago in 1990 or something um, around um, choice shouldn't be about escape, it should be about reform. Um, and so that is where we've sort of zeroed in on the possibility side of things. Um, and for us, we've always thought about the possibility um, uh, in two ways. First, in terms of opportunities for um, breakthrough teaching and learning. Right, and so what we know about effective schools is that schools have to be coherent. Uh, they have to um, operate as a team. They have to have a clear mission and purpose. They need to be the locus of both um, uh, accountability and control in order to really deliver high quality results for all kids. Um, and then so we've always seen that as sort of the fundamental opportunity on the achievement side. Um, and, um, and looked across our 18 cities to look for evidence that that was actually occurring, and there's some, there's some positive things there. Um, uh, you know, much as the, the New Orleans case has its problems um, and challenges, if you look at the achievement results, it's sort of hard to, hard to ignore. So, right, starting with that premise, um, achievement first. And then second, um, around um, new possibilities and hope for families um, that have been in a constrained choice environment before. And by that, I mean really what Mohammed was just talking about, that um, choice um, uh, is typically something that um, more advantaged families um, can enjoy. And um, as a parent of a child with special needs, um, you know, I've been in a desperate strait before. So um, understanding that a lot of folks um, are looking for something that is either um, a desperation move, or is um, a look toward um, a quality of a school that they might not otherwise see um, in the public school, the traditional district school offerings, um, whether that's Montessori or whatever. So, um, so those are you know those are the um, the hopes and possibilities. Um, and our work has really been on the hows. How do you um, uh, figure out what are the best ways to leverage? Um, leverage those opportunities. Um, on the challenges side, I mean, I think that uh, the previous panel did a great job of um, kind of working through the, um, the, the questions that we see in our um, data all the time, that um, the uh, less educated families, um, students with disabilities and their families have particular needs and challenges that one has to um, find ways to address. Um, and so I won't kind of dig into that now, but I can happily talk about some of the um, other strategies that we haven't talked about so far about how mm -hmm. cities are addressing those. Um, and then I'll just raise that the other challenge uh, is on the political um, and financial front um, and the tensions that occur when you 
right, um, move outside of in-district choice and outside and challenge the notion that the district is the only one who can provide um, the options. And then finally, just um, we'll just touch on um, the work at our center has been um, something that we've, we've relied on calling um, the portfolio strategy, although Charmaine's tapestry is much more compelling, so <laughs> we may be rebranding around. But we it. own that. Right? Just to let you, know. uh, <laughs> you trademarked it already. It's trademarked. Okay. Um, and then just just that this is you know something that we've been thinking about from the start around how do you how do you create these reform strategies and um, the portfolio strategy is something that. You know, by um, whatever count you use, 30 or so districts um, like San Antonio um, uh, have been using to um, adopt a continuous improvement strategy and, um, and think about ways to leverage the opportunities and minimize the risk to families. You know, this is a great overview of your work. And you said something also in this article I'd like to just touch on, because it, it goes to do with thinking about systems and thinking about this in the broader context. Sometimes when we talk about schools, I think our image is of the school somewhere, a school someplace. But actually, of course, there's a social context, there's an ecological context, there's always a context. And you wrote something very interesting. I thought that would be willing, especially if we're talking about solutions and, and strategies. You wrote in the same piece, choice requires ongoing attention from both government oversight agencies and community education advocates to ensure that all families can have access to high quality options. When we think about choice and we think about people who talk about choice, some, they don't often talk about government oversight. Could you talk a little bit about that and what you meant by that? Because I think it adds a little to our conversation. Yeah, I mean, our view is that um, the role of government has to really stay focused on performance management um, and managing the equity questions and really ensuring, like Massachusetts has done, that, um, that the most vulnerable kids are being well served in the system of choice. Um, and then there are all these other things, right, that have to happen and um, I would argue should be happening within the district um, tra traditional system as well around parent information, um, uh, uh, making sure that families understand um, where they might find the best fit and how to enroll in schools effectively. And that's where we've seen community organizations really step up. And there's some really interesting things going around the country. Um, Ed Navigators in New Orleans um, works with families and gives them a navigator, um, an advocate really to help them understand um, how to find the best fit. Um, we'll even go to IEP meetings with the family and advocate on their behalf. I certainly wish I had somebody like that when I was, um, when I was fighting for my son. Um, and then uh, organizations like DCERN in DC are doing incredible work to educate families about um, uh, how to look across the system of, um, of choices and try to make sense of a very confusing set of data around performance, um, uh, the approach to culture at the school, whether that's compelling for them, all the things that are really meaningful to families, but you know the big data systems, the researchers, and the government agencies don't always get to those things. Um, and so that's where you know our view is that a, a true portfolio or tapestry is pulling all of those avenues and um, and not just relying on government. Because as much as I'm a believer that government has an essential role in choice. It's really dangerous, I think, to um, constrain ourselves to the idea that a few people in a central office are going to have all the answers for mm -hmm. families. And that's the tension, right? Um, and so the more we can engage the community in really advocating for what they need, and sometimes it is, look, the choices that you've put before us are high quality in terms of the data, but aren't delivering on some of the other things that we're looking for. Uh, we'll come back to that because it's really a, a key topic, thinking yeah. about systems and so forth. But let's uh, let's move on to Claire, who has a lot of experience in this. Um, here's my question to you: um, The International Network for Public Schools grew out of a collaborative effort uh, of the first school, which was founded in 1985, and subsequent three international high schools. Uh, among the many district-run schools of choice in New York City, it now has 28 network schools in five states and in Washington D.C. You've been there almost from the beginning. I said she was from the beginning before she corrected me. Almost from the beginning. 
joining the first school community in 1991. Can you tell us about the International Networks was launched, what it does, and how the network has become such an important option for English learners? I'll try. Um, so speaking about what student needs are, um, English language learners, who I prefer to call actually, and I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to do it, multilingual learners, because I'd rather talk about what their strengths are than what they need to learn, which is English. Um, so multilingual learners, historically, have not been um, served well. They're one of those groups that are furthest from opportunity, which is a phrase I love. Um, and so those students in 1985, the first school was formed because um, actually a local community college realized that in Queens, which was the epicenter of immigration and still is actually the most diverse county in the country, um, Queens was, um, the, the community college was realizing that its students that were, they were getting very few immigrant students who were prepared for college. And so it was started, the first school, as a collaboration between the City University of New York, actually, and the district. Um, and the name was important. The first faculty chose the name international because immigrant is a pejorative term in this country. But international, people get confused. You know, it's one of those private schools, you know, whatever. We wanted our kid to confer prestige on our students, and so that was the reason we chose the name international. Um, and it was founded because there was a need for a school that built on the assets of the students and figured out, and it took about six to eight years to figure it out, um, how to do that well. Um, by the time in 1993, one of the many waves of school reform and opening small schools and the schools of choice that were opening in New York, that first school chose to piggyback on that and opened in 1993 and 1994 the second two schools as part of a variety. I mean, every imaginable source of funding from federal um, Title VII, which was the old Title III, I mean, it's what's now Title III, was Title VII, to the Coalition of Essential Schools, to Annenberg, everything thrown in a pot. Um, and we chose, after the second and third school were formed, to create a partnership that it wasn't one school telling the others, and we never, we try not to talk, and let me rephrase that, depends on what the grant application asks for, but we try not to talk about replicating our schools. We prefer to talk about recreating them, because each one is a creation in the context in which it's being opened. Each community is different. Brooklyn is not Queens, is not Manhattan, is not the Bronx, definitely. And so we need, you know, and I'm not a Yankees fan. I was born in Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Dodgers, I just want to say their home was Brooklyn. So, I know. So, right. So the, the schools, we started a partnership. And at that point, I was a teacher. And I was a teacher until I left the schools in 2003 to create the network. As a teacher, we created a partnership where those schools began to collaborate, intervisitations, projects across the schools. And where I actually fought with the central board because we chose to put money that was coming into the first school into the other schools. And they were like, you can't do that. I said, why not? Well, they, you can't get it back. I don't want it back. I want it there. Those schools need it. We need to do this collaboration. So we, we created that. In 2004, as the small schools movement and Gates was moving around. That name international came in handy because they were, one of the things they began talking about was international education. The Asia Society had international schools. Our name interested them. They really didn't understand the difference between what we were doing and what the Asia Society was doing. In fact, they thought we were going to collaborate on everything because we were going to be their international initiative. That was fine. <laughs> we figured we could open more schools for immigrants. When we, in, 2000, in 1993, we had six applicants for every seat in our first school in New York City. We still were getting way too many. By the time we had four schools, we had one in every borough except Staten Island, still don't in Staten Island. Um, we still were getting multiple, way too many applicants for every seat. And so we didn't 
we, we are small schools. So the solution was to create more schools created in different communities that met the needs of those communities. And our strategy was to look at the data, which we had to fight for, to figure out where in eighth grade and ninth grade there were recently arrived immigrants. Two criteria for admission to our school, we like to think of ourselves as highly selective. You theoretically, actually, you don't really have to take the test, but you have to take a test to get in. The issue is you have to fail it. You cannot be proficient in, inter in English and oh, enter our school. That's an interesting thing. We, we, you can't come in. We want students that no one else in many cases wants. We want the students who are recently arrived in the country, generally less than four years at the time of admission, and who don't speak English. So in 2004, as we began to um, we were approached to, I was still a teacher, to open the schools. We actually wrote our first grant not knowing that we were in a nonprofit because I didn't know what a nonprofit was. I was a teacher um, and I was running a project. So we opened um, the first two schools in 2004 or 5 and became, so 19, 1985 to 93, we opened all of four schools, those schools just helping each other. Ni 2003 to today, we opened another 24 schools. 16 in the city of New York. At this point, um, <coughs> slightly less than 1 in 10, slightly more than 1 in 10, it's like 1.2. Um, kids who are recent immigrants in the high schools in New York go to one of our schools. We have never wanted to be the only choice. We support bilingual education schools. We support a variety of models because we think English language learners deserve as much choice as anybody else. But we also don't think that it just means putting them in the same room. That's what the school board argued in Lau, those of you who know Lau versus Nichols. They had the same opportunities. We're putting them in the same room. They got the same curriculum. Why, why isn't this equal? That hopefully stands. Um, the Supreme Court decided that. And so we provide supports um, for those students. So what the network does that's different is schools can't do this by themselves. So one of the things that we do is we began to, you know, if you go to our website, you'll see like all these core principles. They were developed collaboratively <coughs> by the leaders of the first six schools. They sat in a room, it took two years. The network worked to pull that into six principles, but the question we asked is, so what makes an international an international? And then we hammered that down into the network staff, five core principles. So the definition of who we are and what we do was decide, defined by the practitioners who are working with kids. Um, the second thing, so I guess the two big things we do is we open schools um, overwhelmingly with districts while we are agnostic as an organization on charters, districts, or whatever. I was asked by the leader of a union in one of the schools who said, what do you want to do in our school? I said, open a school for immigrants. He said, is it going to be a charter? I said, I don't really care. I'm happy to do a district school. You're going to help make that choice for me. But we're going to open a school for immigrant kids. So um, we open schools, and we have a variety of things that we do to support them. And we support schools and network them. Somebody has to help schools network. They're kind of inward focused if, you, if they don't have people, and so we do that. Those are the two big, and we advocate. We're not shy about that. <laughs> I, I imagine not. That would be great. <laughs> you know, any of you have ever had a chance in New York to go to one of the international high schools, you really ought to do it, because it's actually incredible. All these youngsters from all these different places speaking all these languages and the pedagogy that's been evolved over time is so dynamic, but it's also so student-centered. It's quite an experience, actually. John, um, Peter, <laughs> uh, let me let me ask you a couple. I, I, you've had a, a lot of experience at the managerial level. We are talking about systems, you know, and how this works. So let me just put this question out to you. But feel free to develop uh, develop a little bit from your experience. Um, in your recent book, Wildflowers: A School Superintendent's Challenge to America, you say it is time to quote relinquish dogma and ideology and reframe the endless debate over education through the perspective that matters most, that of our children. How did you reframe the choice question in Sacramento so that the needs of children were better met? And if you could give some examples. And one piece to touch on, probably maybe as a transportation issue in terms of systems, but 
take that question and go with it anywhere you want to. The, the wonderful part about going last is either everything's been said, <laughs> uh, you've either run out of time, or um, you learned something. And um, I've actually learned a lot this morning being here, the first panel, and then you know this panel now. And by the way, I did bring a copy of my book for who, whoever answers, or whoever asks the first question, uh, other than you, Peter, uh, I will give a copy to. So happy right. to do that. Um, Great book. You know, uh, I think this, I love this idea of choice. Is, uh, is it a destination? You know, is it an end or is it a means? And I, I learned a lot, you know, when I was in Charlotte, Mecklenburg. You know, Charlotte had a lot of great schools, a lot of magnet schools. You know, there really weren't any charter schools in, in Charlotte. Um, you know, because they gave, I think, a voice, right, to every, every community. And uh, there's a lot of middle class and affluent families still in Charlotte. And, um, you know, I think when, when you, you know, when you don't listen, right, I think you ultimately end up, it ends up kind of like a, an end or a destination, right? And so we had a lot of those in, in Charlotte, um, a lot of great schools, I mean, doing everything. Uh, except the big issue was, like, nobody ever talked to, with anybody. There was no there was no sharing, right? The accountability model that we've talked about, right? It, and, and I would say same in Massachusetts today, it doesn't incentivize sharing and learning and cooperation and collaboration. I mean, if it did in Massachusetts, that, you know, that cap would have been voted, you know, to be expanded by the public if these schools are doing such wonderful things. But the accountability model, and same in Charlotte, right? There was no there was no incentive, and, and how do I know? I, well, I was the first chief accountability officer, right? And, and when my oldest daughter, who was in first grade, was learning to read, you know, she comes home one day and she, she grabs my business card and she says, you know, Daddy, you know, what does a chief accountability officer do, right? And, and in this like Grinch-like moment, you know, when you know, the Grinch is, is stealing Cindy, you know, Cindy Lou who says, you know, why are you stealing our Christmas tree? And he's like, uh, I said, well, honey, my job's to catch people doing good things, right? <laughs> Because I had heard from a principal that she said, you know what, there's these nuances that happen in our school, right, every day that nobody ever sees, nobody ever recognizes, and most importantly, nobody ever replicates, right? Because they were destinations, they were ends, right? And we had this wonderful researcher from Yale, a woman named Justine Hastings, and she did this incredible study in Charlotte that I, it doesn't get any play today, but it's, she found that the cohort effect, meaning if you mix kids, right, is three times more powerful in terms of academic achievement and all these other things that we want of kids than, uh, than having a great teacher in, 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 in front of that classroom. So if, if you mix kids, right? But I think most of the models today are all about kind of forced mixing, right? We don't, we don't provide, I think, really choice grounded in local community choice, right? Um, and so with all that background, I'm sort of thinking, and I thought about a lot of this just this morning, when I came to Sacramento, right? I mean, we had so many kids, right, furthest from opportunity. I mean, we had, we didn't have a tapestry, but there were a lot of quilt patches, like, you know, spread out all over the place with like long waiting lists, right? Some of the best schools that happened to pop up, a lot of them stimulated by the remaining middle class that was in Sacramento. They had established these, these little islands, right, with huge waiting lists. Or the charter community was like, you know, angry and vicious and, right, nobody ever spoke to them. And they were just, they were out there, they were doing their thing, right? They had a voice because no one else was listening. So, you know, for me, coming to California in 2009, which, by the way, a good friend of mine said, like, nobody's going to be a superintendent in California at this time. It's like, it's like, and he grabbed me, he said, it's like hitting the beaches of Normandy wearing an orange suit. <laughs> But I was like, look, man, I know that. But, you know, there are kids showing up to school on, on Monday. And so if, if not now, when? And if not me? And so I came with a different set of eyes. And I came to really listen. And if we listen, if we really listen, right, the answers are in the community, right? So, you know, as we started to take what I say is a, you know, think systemically, right, but design locally, right? So when we looked around, we were bleeding kids, right? We had families and children furthest from opportunity. We had these little pockets, and yet we were bleeding, you know, kids out to Elk Grove, out to, out, out to Natomas. I mean, they were just going, but we had families coming into Sacramento every day, right? Coming in to work at the Capitol, and then, and then they were leaving. And we had neighborhoods that were just, you know, filled with, you know, um, multi-generational Chinese families, and yet 
we didn't have one Chinese language immersion school in our district, right? San Francisco had three or four, right? Same kind of a community. And so those families were going elsewhere, leaving our schools kind of like isolated. And so it didn't take long to start to think of, well, we could replicate the schools that have these large waiting lists, right? We, we could move them to campuses that had been closed to a lot, enable them to, you know, to expand. Those were sort of, that was the, that was the low hanging fruit, mm -hmm. right? But then as we thought about even further, right, this idea of, of designing, right, locally. I mean, when you ask families and neighborhoods and communities, and by the way, students, right, when you ask them, like, what do you want in school? Like, what kind of school? And, and then you use design principles, right? So we, we helped communities that had been, again, so far, right? I mean, so far they were on the bottom lists of, you know, the bottom 5% list in California. We gave them an opportunity to redesign themselves, to reimagine what learning could be like. I mean, schools and students and parents and family members were, were involved in, the, in this design process, right? So they, they got the chance to use these really cool tools um, but, but to create really responsive schools that, that met their need, right? So, so choice, right, enabled them to then start to, you know, to create the kind of, of, of schools that they were interested in, 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 in sending their kids to. And, you know, I mean, look, uh, you know, poor families don't, like, leave their best kids at home, right? I mean, they, they all want their kids to have a great education. And they want what's best for their children. They know, and, and, and all families know what a great school is or the good schools, right? But often they just never have access to those kinds of schools. And in, certainly in, in California at that time, you know, I mean, these things like these like yellow like school bus things, like we don't have them in California. I mean, so, you know, people have to walk and we have to think about that. And so the, the whole <laughs> closing school conversation that Patrick, you know, referenced was, it was real, it, you know, if we closed a school in a neighborhood, it became a, you know, a dark spot, yeah. right? Or could we think about moving a school or could we think about, right, some other way? And, you know, we also could start by learning with our charter providers, right? Who, by the way, my first meeting with the charter uh, providers had to be facilitated by somebody from the California Charter School Association because relationships were that bad. Yeah. We had facility use agreements that were just months behind reimbursement rates. I mean, it was, it was that bad. Yeah. And fast forward, you know, we eventually, we took advantage of, you know, one of those compact opportunities that the Gates Foundation did. Probably one of the best things, you know, Gates has done, by the way, but, you know, I can, I can say that being a former, you know, foundation person, but um, <laughs> it enabled us to work together with our charter providers. For nine months, we developed it, and we started sharing professional development opportunities. We started doing school visits with each other. We, we made leadership opportunities available for teachers interested in becoming principals, you know, 20 slots for district teachers, 20 slots for charter teachers. And at the end of those trainings, we had comments like, wow, we never knew the district had teachers that cared about kids. Yeah. You know, so, you know, choice, choice is also about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. to the way it's framed today, it's an either or to get back to your, your, your question about dogma and, and ideology. It's an either or, right? My way, my model, my reform, you know, versus, versus yours or not. And really, to me, choice is a both and, yeah. right? And when it's used as a, as a way and as a means, right? And when you start to design a system around it, right, a system of supports, when you create accountability models that give incentives to learn yeah. and share, you know, you, you get to Charmaine's tapestry. Yeah. Good. That was an excellent conclusion for this panel. Um, um, Spoken like an author. And but we, have, we want to get some questions from the audience. I didn't want to rush you, but I want to make sure we leave some time. So I, I guess we just... <laughs> That's true. can't ask the first question. lady in front, I guess. <laughs> I brought a couple. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Kelly Taylor. I'm a K-5 engineering teacher from Idaho. And I really love the positivity of the discussions and hearing the wonderful things. I guess my question comes in is how do we define high quality schools? And we've heard just such diverse ways of making things work. And it doesn't seem like there's one solution. So how do we incorporate that into a system? And then how do we hold schools accountable if we know that high stakes testing, P 
penalize the schools that take some of the neediest students. That's right. Anybody want to tackle that? We've got. Well, I, I can say one quick thing, which is um, what we're seeing in cities that are really pursuing portfolio, really trying to get kind of a common performance framework across all of their charter and district schools is one, this is really a hard question, right? There's no easy answer to it. And um, most of the folks uh, that we work with are really, you know, being very, very thoughtful in how do you balance clarity of information to parents and clarity of expectations to schools with the, the complexity that we know schools hold um, and that parents are looking for in schools. It's, it's just really hard. And so, you know, our advice is always, this has to be, to some degree, uh, a, a community-based decision. Um, and that's where the, the good work comes in, is when um, uh, cities um, uh, or communities are sitting down with their families and saying, what information um, do you want to see in sort of a, a, a clear quality measure? Um, and then what are all the other things that you want to just know about to help inform your choices? Um, I think most people understand that you know, one test score is not um, is not enough, but ultimately government has to decide how how good is good enough, how bad is bad enough to make some of the hard decisions. Mohammed, do you want to? Yeah. Um, so did someone else want to go first? Well, will yeah. you go and then maybe Claire? Can. Okay. So Texas just shifted through uh, to an A through F system. Um, I think one of the things that we've been fortunate enough is we have a progressive commissioner who understood. Um, that you know, high poverty schools whose baselines start here um, versus affluent school districts who just get them already here, um, um, and then they have kids who come in lower but they get masked in this proficiency game. We created a nuanced system that did prioritize growth, um, and so Texas has these three domains around where you can take the best of proficiency or the or the growth domain, and then it has this other domain cl called closing the gap, which has pissed off a lot of suburban districts, because all of a sudden, they're a C or a B. Um, and because, you know, it's gotta help the other kids too. Uh, um, and so, um, I've appreciated that. Um, do I believe the F label is problematic? Yes. Um, do I think we could come up with other names? Sure. But at the end of the day, we do need to know who our bottom 5% of schools are, and we need to act with urgency. Sometimes that may be closure, or sometimes that might be great turnaround work, right? Which is damn hard, as I've said, but it can be done. We pursued it in Dallas. Um, that's why I respect charter operators who do take on turnaround. Um, there's only a few nationally that do. Um, we, uh, Texas also created a law that allows you to take that concept and develop a local accountability system. Um, and as long as the state piece is at least 50% of your piece. And so we're, we're running with that to create this whole child school performance framework. Um, the core districts in California have done some great work around that. Um, you know, what gets measured gets treasured. Now the question is, do you start uh, um, having consequences if your kids are not growing social emotional, like when do you start that consequence? Or is it just you report it and just by reporting it, you get people to behave differently. So we're having that conversation and tension. At the end of the day, we need a decision-making framework that looks at a child holistically to be able to act and improve schools. So, okay. Claire, did you want to jump in here for a second? Um, very briefly, what I wanted to also add is, so one of the reasons a lot of schools do not wish to serve the population we serve is because they'll lower their, you know, results on the various accountability measures. And that's one of the reasons I think a network has been really critical. Our stance has been, with every school we've ever opened, and in conversations with the district, has been our job is to, we're, we're on the high school level, our job, measure us by how many kids graduate. Measure us by how successful they are and go on to college. We're not, we told in the California districts, we're gonna bomb on your 10th grade accountability measures, because you give them in 10th grade. Our kids are not gonna be able to do much in English. I don't care. Check, come back to us when they have to graduate. That's what I'm interested in. The second thing is, you can take on issues like when a, unaccompanied mi a minors arrive and they're overaged, and to say they're under credit is an understatement. Um, and 
they're not going to graduate, maybe ever, because they're coming in at 20 and have, you know, a year and a half. So our stance has been schools serve kids, the network advocates for the changes that need to be made. And so we've bifurcated that purposefully, and we provide the supports to the schools, and we deal with, you know, state education and so forth on what the accountabilities measures need to be to ensure that every school is willing and we don't want, you know, disincentivize schools to serve English language learners. And then there's performance assessment. I'm not going to talk just, about just it. Just really, really quick. I, you know, that's, I love the question, and, and I don't fully believe in quantitative, you know, measuring systems. I don't care what state, right? I mean, the bottom 5% listing in California, I think, is just, it misses so much. And so um, <clears throat> I really believe in qualitative models, you know, school quality reviews. You know, a lot of places, they don't use them because they're hard, they're expensive, they take time. But if we're really committed, to this thing called continuous improvement, right? Which I think we look at it too much as a, a technical science versus the human relationship mm -hmm. component. When you've got you know principals working together, you know reviewing each mm -hmm. other's schools. When you've got teams of educators and parents doing you know assessments to really assess and to to to, to self-assess where they are. You know that's when you really start to kind of drive improvement. And you know one piece, and we did in Sacramento, we had, we had community reviews, right? So we trained parents and community members to look at just two things. You know, is is the climate and culture welcoming, right? And you know, is it a place where I'd want what my child? You know, and again, right? Parents and communities they know, and you need that pressure if you really want to have improvement. If we really want to see great schools, we've got to get that community mm -hmm. that community ownership, Absolutely. and they they won't own it if they're not invited into the school. And can I just add to that? I think it's it's more than just information. It's truly engagement. Mm -hmm. A lot of these issues get addressed if we're continuously engaging families and including them in the decision-making process about what teaching and learning looks like. Mm -hmm. When we have to create schools, when we have to close down schools, when we have to ask for bonds for air conditioning, that's when we choose to go to community. But if you found a fundamentally different way of engaging students and families and community members in the entirety of the decision-making process, a lot of these things would begin to subside. Yeah. Great. All right, how are we doing? We done? All right. Well, thank you very much. For our panel, I want to say thank you for all your good work. Uh, Patrick is going to do a little wrap-up for us, so I think if we want to go back to our seats, that'd be, that'd be great. Thanks. Great. So thank you, um, everyone, for coming. That was a, a great panel. You know, we heard a lot at the beginning and in the first panel about the, you know, the opportunities and the challenges. And I think this panel really sort of underscored people taking the opportunity to take on some of those challenges. You know, I just to um, highlight a couple themes. You know, both Jonathan and the internationals and Mohammed in, in San Antonio. You know, focused about um, really involving the community and building on the needs of kids first and issues around organization and choice and all of that followed the needs, the expressed needs of the community and the identified needs of the kids. I think that's a really a good point. So with that, I just want to remind everybody that the report is available online, as will the PowerPoint be soon, and that this is part of a series of events, and there'll be additional for at least two more coming in the winter and spring. So stay tuned. We're going to have a blog series on this topic, and so that'll be coming out. So there'll be a lot more information. And in the report are a set of over 100 uh, citations, so you can get to all of the data underneath if you have a particular in interest in ELs or in, in magnets or in special education or something like that, there's resources there that you'll be able to get to. And then finally, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Peter and Janelle for organizing this and getting it together. And Shawnice and Crystal and the whole LPI team back there who did all the work to actually make it happen. The comms team up here who organized stuff. Thank you very much. And again, thank you all for coming.